So it is 7.32 p.m. on Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. Uh, first, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Uh, Venkat Holly. Here. Uh, Daniel Rigadelli. Here. And Elaine Hoffman. Here. To have you all. Um, on behalf of the town, our administrator, Rick Vallarelli. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Rick. And assisting us as well uh, is Vincent Lee. Here. Good to have you with us as well. Um, and then also just want to make sure that uh, if there's someone here representing uh, 189 Forest Street, the applicant here. Yes, hi, my name is Ilya. Yeah, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2023 at the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals of the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So moving on to our agenda, the administrative items on tonight's agenda will be taken up after tonight's hearing. I uh, therefore am tabling items two, three, and four on the agenda so we can move on to item number five, which is docket 3731-189 Forest Street. Before opening the hearing, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce the agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce themselves, make their presentation to the board. I will then request that the members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. So with that, um, I would turn to the applicant for um, Ilya. And if you could introduce yourself and your company and what you are intending to do. And do you have a presentation you want to show or do you want me to bring up the drawings? Uh, I think you can bring up the drawings. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and do that. Good evening, everybody. My name is Elias Vinigarotsky. I represent IG Investments. Uh, my partner, Gene Bernstein, is on the line as well, as well as our um, architect, Eric Zacherson, so he can speak a little bit more about the design. Uh, what we are proposing today is um, to do a large addition to the existing structure located at 189 Forest Street. Uh, we are uh, looking to stay within the existing setbacks and utilize the um, very large 
um, backyard to kind of do the addition as well as add additional floor. Just wait for the zoom in. Okay. Are you seeing the the plan, the site plan? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So, to, if you look at the center of the uh, diagram, the the light is the existing house, and the rear. Uh, block is the addition that we're going, and uh, the next couple of pages will show the exact the layout of the house. And Eric, if you want to jump in to discuss a little bit more details, please feel free to do so. Did you want? Did you want me to explain the the walk yeah. through the plan? Okay. Um, Sorry, he's moving around a little bit. So uh, on this level that, that you've pulled up here, this is the main living level with a uh, living room at the bottom of the page and the kitchen in the middle, uh, dining room towards the front, the screened porch at, um, at the top of the drawing, at kind of at the back of the site. Uh, if you want to scroll to the, oh, sorry. And uh, on the left, you see, uh, the primary bedroom at the bottom of the bedroom with the second bedroom and, and a bedroom at the far end with a, a, a kind of lounge sitting area at the top of the connecting stairs between the two between these two main levels. I think that what's yeah and then there's a, a basement plan. I think the elevation is actually kind of maybe the most interesting um, part of the project because it, it shows how this project really sits into the yeah the um, these are the short elevations existing and proposed, but on the the next page, you see how this this project's fairly long, but it really sits into the um, yeah, it sits into the uh, slope of the na the natural slope of the site, and so that 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 first level that we were looking at really extends from from kind of the well above the sidewalk uh, to the point where it's almost buried at the back of the property, and the top floor is. Um, uh, a, a third floor on one end of the building and and um, about six feet above grade uh, at the rear deck. That's the opposite direction. So you see how it, we're kind of extending the existing, the lower image here is the existing home and how we're kind of leaving that, but extending it back um, both the, the, the main floor and, and the uh, addition floor, the upper floor. Yeah, and then there's that section that also kind of helps explain the, the situation and how we're going to use that the garage area there uh, on, on what is called the basement level, but is uh, really um, you can drive right into it at the front sidewalk. And then it's like Blanche is showing how really deep this site actually is. So to summarize, we're trying to utilize the long and narrow lot, which is oversized lot, to really do the extension on the building that are really impacting the view from the street as you drive down Forest Street. The front of the building will only look um, basically a floor elevated and the rest of it is all the addition in the back. So it doesn't really impact the look that, um, significantly from the main road. Um, did you receive a cop to the Unfortunately, it came out rather late, but the Department of Planning and Community Development came out with a comment letter. Um, it came out just before five o'clock today, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know if you had an opportunity to see it or not. Um, I was going to just go ahead and pull.
pull that up. Um, is this it? That's what I'm looking for. So this is uh, from them, just the basics about the the site and reviewing some of the um, the criteria that are required for a special permit. Um, but they had they had a couple of questions which. Go ahead and put in at this point. So the the first um so the the driveway itself, um do you know it so it's pitching up from the sidewalk to the building itself? That's correct. Okay. Um <clears throat> there was a they had they had raised a question about that with regards to the zoning bylaw, but the the zoning bylaw restricts you if the driveway is headed downwards towards this parking space, but not upwards. So um, that wouldn't apply in this condition. Um, and the other question they had, so on your plan where you're talking about um, the site plan, you have identified most of the lot as being usable open space, mm -hmm. um, but the definition of usable, but the, the way that it, you're calculating it doesn't comport with the way that the definition is in the zoning bylaw for Arlington. Um, do you know what the slope of the yard of the rear yard is at all? Um, not off the top of my head. I would have to consult them. Okay. Because if it's if it's greater, I can than... figure it out in a few seconds. Here, yeah. I've got, I we've drawn this quite a few times. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets a little steeper after the house. So I'm just going to do from the house to the sidewalk at the moment. Well, essentially, if it's, it only counts as usable open space if it's less than 8%. Yeah, I remember that. Um, right now, the, the, from the rear of the proposed house to the sidewalk is at uh, almost exactly 15%. Okay. Um, from the front of the house to the sidewalk, is almost flat. It is uh, um, three over seventeen inches <laughs> over seventeen feet. Okay. So. That portion is one and a half percent. Okay. And this, as soon as it hits the front, the existing front of the house, which is the proposed front of the house, also, that's when it gets up to being in the 15 ish percent range, 15, 16 percent range. Okay. And does that basically continue for the rest of the site? Um, I believe so. Uh, it's been a while since I looked up back there, but I think so. Well, I'm trying to find the survey beyond that goes beyond our site the links not coming up uh yeah it does it, it pretty consistently continues up to an elevation 224 224 whereas is that 200 at the front of the site so, yeah from that point front of the house 27 over 146. Yeah, 18%. It it okay. it may even get a little steeper after the house ends. Okay. 
proposed house ends. Thank you. Um, so the existing driveway that runs at the side of the house, that's going to be demolished. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a new driveway here. Are the turns in the driveway just to so that it meets the existing curb cut? That's good. Yeah. Okay. And does the driveway currently egress over the, the side lot line the way it's drawn here? Uh, I think so. Um, let me see if it's on the survey. And then, um, yes. Okay. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, I can't say for sure, but about a foot and a half. Okay. <clears throat> and then just trying to understand the existing setbacks on the house. So currently the house is 2.6 feet from the side lot line. At the smallest point, yes. The smallest point. And then the addition will be larger than that. It looks like the addition is three point, somewhere between 3.3 .3 and 3.4. Correct. Never less than three feet from that. But uh, yeah, 3.3, .3 I think, is the smallest point. And then on the opposite side, the closest the proposed gets is nine feet, five inches. Um, the existing at the very front, there's a pinch point that is uh, that is try that again. Nine point one at the front, I think is what it's labeled. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then I was I <clears throat> was going back through the the zoning biologist to make sure I had all this straight. So while it does somewhat appear to be a three story structure, it is only a two story. Um, the definition for a bait so the the level where the parking is, where the car is, is considered a cellar because mm. the less than half of it is above the average grade for the project. Mm -hmm. um, and as a cellar, it does not count towards usable. I mean, it does not count as a story. So uh, the basement level is still, even though the basement level is exposed at the front, it doesn't count as a store. It, it's a cellar. It doesn't count as a floor. Um, so it is just a two, two stories. Um, and on the plans, it's identified that the, I believe the spaces, uh, the attic spaces are not inhabited and not inhabitable, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, And so the the building itself, obviously, you're um, to, uh, turning the back por the proposed back portion to um, be a consistent distance from the side yard lot line. Um, did you look at all at moving it farther from the side lot line, or was is there a particular reason for the for the size you're using? Um, we we didn't want to make the building. A any skinnier that like than it is it just kind of got to the point where the rooms were kind of were a little awkward um and we we didn't want to we wanted to try and kind of respect its neighbors relatively so on one side we have 2.6 and we expanded that to three on the other side we've got 9.1 and expanded it to nine five but the the reasoning for that was really because 
uh, it, like it, we didn't want to make either side worse than it was um, currently. We don't want to get closer to either a neighbor on either side um, and yet fight making it any longer than it already is. And then on, so to the to the left-hand side, which is the, the narrowest side, um, on the site plan, you show briefly where the abutting house is, but you only show a portion of it. Do you know how far back the abutting house goes relative to where the addition is going. I don't know. I don't. That's not a survey. I'm okay. Not familiar with that. Ilya might know. Right. Are there open up for questions from the board? Any questions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, in light of the discussion we had earlier uh, about usable open space, I find myself somewhat confused. It's clear that the tabulation that is in the application and in the zoning package is not right. Um, and that the, and it does not follow what we have in the bylaw. Um, the area, all of the area, really, from on either side of the of the house, it seems seems too skinny to count. Uh, and the area behind the house might be too steep to count. And while I followed pretty much what the discussion was earlier, it leaves me with a question as to whether or not uh, this actually can meet the usable open space requirements of the. Uh, of the bylaw and it's it's hard to evaluate that just on the basis of the conversation we've had without seeing accurate delineations that apply our bylaw definition um do you want us to rebut uh, to answer yeah, that? you could respond to that question sure yeah our our uh our understanding is that this the uh site doesn't really have uh much open space except for what's in front of the property today because it's all over eight percent um and there you know we kind of took some license with that and said okay well we want to preserve what is there we want to preserve kind of the green space that doesn't count as green space um but we need to have a driveway somewhere so we put it here instead of on the side um but we don't believe we're making the green space the amount of open space less than what we what exists today because so little of the site is actually below eight uh eight percent slope so mr chairman if i can mm -hmm. please what that suggests to me is that what we're being told is that this is actually non-conforming already um in terms of usable open space and that uh, this makes it only marginally worse, something of, of that kind is, is, I wonder if that's the view that he takes of it. The, you know, when I look at the tabulation, I'm told that there's 14% now and there's gonna be 40%. And that clearly isn't right. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out how this stands, if this is a question about whether or not um, there's a substantial extension of an existing nonconformity. We haven't had any discussion about that in the, either in this, the, in the what we've done so far, or in the uh, memorandum from the planning department. <clears throat> no, certainly there's, um, there are several places where this built where the existing house is nonconforming, um, and there were. A number of them listed um, initially. The side yard setbacks are both non-conforming. Um, the front, I believe, the street frontage is non-conforming. Um, the it would appear that the site might be non-conforming in terms of usable open space, and you know, as, as you know, those are all important. Um, 
factors to consider because of the way that um, the state law is written that if you have a if you don't have a nonconformity and you want to make something nonconforming, it's a variance application. But if you have an existing nonconformity and you want to make it more nonconforming, um, the board can review that under the special permit criteria, but it has to make a finding that um, the requested change is not more detrimental uh, to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Um, and so that's something we'll have to, one thing we'll have to consider is, do we have enough information uh, based on the, the data that's been provided to us to, to be able to make that assertion? And then um, if it is, do we, if we do have enough information, is that something that we, we feel is correct? Um, <clears throat> There are further from the board at this time? Mr. Chair. Mr. Gardelli. <clears throat> I just have a question about the extension of the nonconformity at the side yard lot lines. Ah, I, and I was looking at the zoning code, but now I can't find the section. So maybe you can remind me. But I think um, in previous discussions, we've talked about extension of existing nonconformity uh, with uh, the assumption that it's extending the, the actual non-conforming wall, mm -hmm. um, where this is sort of like, you know, it's set back, it's, it's not worse than the non-conforming uh, nature of the existing structure, but it is a sort of different shape and uh, coming into the lot in a different way. Could you just clarify uh, what that rule is for me as we talk about this? Sure. So sure. there. There, uh, there was an amendment to the zoning bylaws now meeting last year. Um, so there used to be something about if you maintained at an existing, if you maintained the existing setback and you extended parallel to the lot line, that that would that that was allowed. Um, but the implication of that was that if you got closer to the lot line that it was not allowed, which is actually incorrect because under state law, you are allowed, if you have an existing nonconformity, you are allowed to intensify the nonconformity. Um, but it, you have, the board has to make a determination that it's not more detrimental. Um, okay. But it is a very interesting point you raised that, you know, they're technically, they're not increasing the level of nonconformity. Right now, the side yard setback is 2.6 feet and that is not changing. Um, on the opposite side, the setback is 9.1 feet, and that is not changing. Um, so in that regard, they are not increasing the level of nonconformity. It's they're maintaining it. Um, but as we were discussing in regards to the the question of usable open space, is technically they are required to have a certain percentage, and because the building is getting larger, technically they're supposed to have more usable open space, and they don't have any. Um, and so in that case, they are intensifying an existing nonconformity, um, which the board can consider. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I just wanted to point out that in, in the past, we had a number of cases in which they have, when there hasn't been an increase in the building footprint so that the increase in gross floor area was only uh, an increasing in the amount within the, within the, the footprint that exists that uh, the we came to the conclusion, I think the, plan, the uh, building inspector did, that that would not be extending an existing nonconformity. Uh, but here, of course, we are e expanding by quite a bit the, the foundation. And so that principle, which we, we spent a lot of time during the fall coming to, uh, doesn't apply here. And we don't actually have, as far as I know, we don't have a determination by the, the uh, inspectional services as to whether they believe that this does constitute a significant extension of the nonconformity. I believe this is coming to us because it is a large addition. Um, it's an addition of over 750 square feet outside the existing footprint of the house. Um, but your 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 question is is well taken too. That we whether or not this is considered. Um, under that section of the law, uh, we don't have a specific statement to that effect. 
Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Um, just for clarification, so is the area that is proposed for the addition also greater than 8% grade? My understanding from the applicant is yes. Okay. So they're not, there's no question of eating up existing usable open space. I think the only place where that could be a question is at the very front of the building. Okay. Um, but what I don't know is whether there is existing usable open space at the front. The applicant had said that this area was flatter and the driveway initially hugged the right side of the house. So it is possible that there was a space um, at the front that met the criteria, but I don't know that for certain. Is that something, Mr. Chairman, that we would want to know? I think it would be it would be certainly useful to know. Yeah. Hi, I'm Gene Bernstein. I'm uh, Ilya's partner on this project. Um, currently, hey. the hi, sorry, coming in late. Um, currently, right now, the driveway goes from where the curb cut is all the way down to the side of the building to pretty much where the back staircase is to the right of the sideway. So there is a pavement that covers all this space that we would be opening up, pretty much trading our driveway for that. So I believe that it's pretty much, we it's gonna be the same open space as, as it was, as it is currently right now, um, because we'd be giving up the right to, for more open space. Um, also in the back right now, um, past that uh, staircase, there is a standalone uh, garage right now that we would be also taken down. And um, with that, we believe that, you know, with some with kind of some trees down, we would actually be able to provide a pretty decent backyard there that currently does not exist. Okay. <clears throat> you don't happen to know the distance along the front lot line from the edge of the existing driveway towards the, the left hand side yeah i'm just looking at some pictures it's pretty much like if you could see where that side staircase is it yep. almost goes right to that um i don't have the exact calculation but um from just from looking at it from my eye i think it's on <laughs> the same distance um mm -hmm. driveway actually i think our dis our new proposed driveway is obviously smaller in terms of um distance but it is wider than the current one And I just want to make a point that um, I believe a uh, question to our neighbor on the left. Um, they did a very, I don't know if the current owner did the same thing, but at one point ownership um, did very similar um, addition with, I believe they have a front garage as well. Um, I wish I had some pictures um, for you. Um, it doesn't go as back as our proposed, um, but I do believe in terms of story and addition it does go uh, further than our current house does now yeah. and the current condition of the house is just in really really rough shape and obviously it's under 900 square feet right now um we just felt like having a 2500 i believe this one's uh, closer to 2800 square foot house on a in this neighborhood and we're not trying to change any uh, look of it from the front. Um, again, we're trying to stay within this current setbacks. Um, we we believe that this is going to help the neighborhood and help this this sore thumb um, come to actual usable house that uh, hopefully a new family would really enjoy. Thank you. So the the existing house that's there now, you are raising the roof. Is that correct you're not leaving the existing roof in its current location uh that's correct do you know how much you're raising it by um eric if you can jump in on that i can't see the calculations on the screen uh about the the peak would be raised about seven feet seven foot uh five inches Are there other questions from the board? Any? 
<clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm now going to go ahead and open the meeting for public comment. Uh, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask their questions and make comments. Those you who wish to speak should digitally raise your hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. And those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair. You'll be asked to give your name and address for the record. And you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair and please remember to speak clearly. Um, anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go first. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the allocated time has ended, the public comment period will be closed. And if you would like me to show the documents, um, please go ahead and ask. So quickly jot down the list. All right, thank you. So with that, uh, the first on the list is um, Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I've been looking at the plans and also trying to online see uh, what the tree cover is. I think the planning department's memo suggested that perhaps a tree plan would be necessary. It was, they weren't sure. And the answer is, I believe, yes, a tree plan will be necessary before any commencement of work demolition or otherwise, um, because I believe, and this is the thing I'm having a hard time with, I'm, I'm trying to find out whether or not the addition is going to require the taking of a significant number of trees in the backyard. The reason I'm having trouble is that I'm having trouble locating the property uh, lit up with daylight. Uh, so it, it looked from the winter picture, there's a number of trees along the driveway, um, which probably will be retained since the driveway is just being removed. But uh, behind the house, is there a significant number of trees? So that would be my first question. Thank you. Um, I'll put that to the applicant. Are there, the site plan we have doesn't have a lot of detail about the existing condition of the demolition. So are there trees in the location that need to be removed for the creation of the addition? Um, I don't believe so. Um, I believe all most of the trees are past the um, where they exist in garages right now. But um, I can definitely confirm that I I, I wouldn't have that. Um, okay. I haven't been on the site for a couple of weeks now. And if the town requires to do the replanting plan, we're definitely open to doing that. That's, um, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Moore. Uh, yeah, the, the replanting is something that uh, we don't necessarily offer as an option. If you take trees that are in the various setbacks around the town, uh, they, they have to, uh, a fee has to be paid to a fund, which, uh, which will uh, look to plant street trees. Uh, however, uh, behind the property here, uh, clearly there's I mean, when I say clearly, I don't, I can't say clearly because again, I was having trouble locating the actual aerial view of the property. Um, that, that will be a requirement. So the, the first step that would have to be taken tree-wise is a tree plan has to be developed of all the trees, six inches and greater in, di in diameter breast height on the property. And then also notated to say, what is going to be taken by the addition uh, and also how the trees that are not going to be taken but are going to be in the construction zone would be protected in the process of the development work. This is an extensive rebuild, so there will have to be some significant protections to the trees that will remain. Uh, just want to make sure the applicant is aware of, of those uh, details. Uh, at, at one, other, one last question. I know I don't have a lot of time here. Um, the driveway that's being removed is going to be replaced by what? Uh, is it going to be permeable? And is it going to 
is any of this going to contribute significantly to the runoff from the property? Uh, Gene? When you say runoff, you mean drainage? Yes. So we were told that as part of the permit process, we do need to um, do the drainage calculation. We haven't gone to that process yet because we didn't, we're didn't. we not there yet. But of course, as an actual permit application, that would be something that submitted and meets the town requirements. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, just sort of following up on that question, though, is the intent for the area where the former garage and driveway were, what is the intention for that area? Is that to be seated for lawn? Is that being landscaped? What's the... Um, kind of the green space. And we'll work with um, uh, the, the planting architect just to make sure that it makes sense. Okay. Uh, next is uh, Kathy Connolly. Hi there. Can you oh, hear me? I, yes. If I could have your name and address for the record. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I have a prepared statement. My name is Kathy Connolly, and I'm the owner of 187 Forest Street, which is directly next door to 189. I'm on the right hand side of the of 189 as you face the house. Thank you. OK, um, I'm I'm opposed to the current proposal for the redevelopment of this property. And under uh, 3.6.1 of the Arlington zoning rules, I'm asking the board to post postpone the decision making and continue this hearing at a later date uh, to allow us, the nearby neighbors and homeowners, to seek effective representation. This proposal package, uh, including the plans and the, all the paperwork, uh, was just posted and made available to us four days ago. Um, and I don't understand how we can advocate for our interests if we don't have enough time to consult the experts and to understand the implications to our properties. I, I'm not a building or a real estate expert, um, but at first glance, I have some real concerns about this proposal. Um, they are the the size and the increase in the size of a house based on what's there now. We have a 900 foot square foot house and you're growing it to 2,900 square feet, which is like a 222% increase. Um, and so that I, I, we live in modest houses and my particular house is listed as historic. Um, and the size of this proposed house is way out of scale with my house and the other dwellings in our neighborhood. And at the current scale, it will dwarf my house and then the house next door to it, 191, which is Layla Moore, um, and have a significant negative impact on the character of our neighborhood and potentially the resale value of our, of our houses. I mean, especially Layla will sit between these two giant um, houses and dwarfing her house and in this narrow little corridor. Secondly, um, the, as mentioned, drainage is a huge problem in this neighborhood, especially 187, 185 and 191 forest. We have wet basements and have invested a lot of money to fix this. Um, and with the increase of the footprint of the proposed house, uh, there will be less ground surface area to absorb the rain and the runoff from the expansion of new roofs and gutters. This will cause more runoff that will go directly into my basement, causing damage, uh, additional remediation and impacting the value of my property. I guarantee it, it's getting worse and worse over time and this is only going to make it worse. I have questions, lots of questions uh, about the height of the structure and things like that and the information in the plans, but I'm really not an expert. Um, so this is where it comes down to the fact that we need more time uh, and, and experts to help us to understand this. And this is happening way too fast. Uh, uh, so I, I've just raised just a few 
concerns in this sh short period of time I've had to look at your actual proposals. Um, and again, we need time to have a lawyer or building consultant to help us better understand the full impacts of this um, so we can bring it back to the attention of the board and have meaningful representation, which we're entitled to. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, next on our list, I just lost whoever was next on the list. Um, uh, so then uh, it would be uh, John Sanchangelo. Mr. Chairman, I think next on the list was Ms. Niles. Indeed, she took her hand down. Oh, she's, her hand is back. Ms. Niles, if you could go ahead and um, unmute yourself. I'm sorry. No, I, 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 I'm sorry. I put my hand down and I got rid of myself. Anyway, good evening, Mr. Chairman and, and everyone here on the call. Um, I'm Layla Moore Niles. I live at 191 Forest Street since 1998. I appreciate this hearing tonight um, and being heard. I'm opposed to this proposal. I'm deeply troubled by, by it. Um, putting almost a 3,000 square foot house on a narrow lot that's 12 feet away from my house and among many other modestly sized houses um, that, you know, as people have mentioned, we have hydrology and storm water issues will negatively impact our homes, um, our property values and diminish the enjoyment that we have of our yards and homes. And I also believe could possibly diminish the integrity of our foundations, but the proposed house is not in harmony with the neighborhood. Um, I didn't retain a lawyer yet. Um, I'm, I'm really thinking that if I could paint a picture of, you know, the gentleman that couldn't find our property on the map, it's because it's very narrow. I mean, my house is on a very narrow lot. I'm to the left of 189, and it's 12 feet away from my house. Now it's going to go back over 55 feet, and it's going to go up at least 32 feet in the air. I will have no sunlight and no views out of either floors, my kitchen window or my bedroom window. Um, I, I mean, to me, it's it's just... It's, I can't really picture it, honestly. I look already, I look out at a house on the left hand side because another monstrous house is there, 193, 195. A house was torn down illegally. And then this monster was built. So on the right, with this proposal, I mean, I'll have no view. I'll look at another house. I have some pictures if people want to see how close it is. Um, I don't think the special permit should be granted. I also found there were some discrepancies in the application. Many people have mentioned it and I've appreciated that the, about the open space, it shows less usable space on one page saying, you know, existing was 7,558 square feet going down to 7,466 square feet. And then on the next page, it's increased to 40% of the property. So, you know, I, I don't understand how you can put, go from 922 square foot dwelling and then go to 29 plus 100 square feet and have an increase. I do believe that's a violation. I really enjoy the space in my backyard. Um, the narrow, the, you know, I, I knew the house was close to that house and narrow, but we enjoy <clears throat> the space in the back. And it is like a little, you know, haven, so to speak. And now that's all gonna be destroyed. I appreciate that um, there was a comment by the, the builder 
that the front is being tastefully done so we won't see the huge building that's in the back, but the back is me, John, and um, John to my right, and uh, Casey. And I, I just feel this is really, really, really going to be a problem for all of us, not only with the diminishing of the property values, which I believe it will, um, but also what about sunlight and views? So I really um, hope that you'll reject this proposal this evening. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Um, if I could ask you a quick question. Um, so how far, so the, the back of the, the existing house at 189, where is the back of your house relative to that? Are you, does your house come farther back right now? Is, there, is it about even with it? Where does that? My house goes slightly back. My kitchen windows, look out partly on their little breakfast nook, but it is only about six feet off the ground from my level. They're down a bit. Okay. So I have a beautiful view there. And then I have a little laundry room off of that. You know, okay. my house is slightly longer than their house. I have 1400 square feet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Now we'll go to uh, John Santangelo, excuse me. Uh, John, you are muted still. There we go. I see you're unmuted, but I'm not hearing you. I'm still muted on the microphone. Oh, on the. Oh, there we go. I have three mutes on, so <laughs> no one would be able to hear me. Um, my name is John Santangelo. I live at 185 Forest Street. Um, and I'm also opposed to the project. There are, I mean, it's just a very large addition. It, I mean, it's ba basically like building two houses behind the current house, given that it's over 200% increase in its square footage and there are just many discrepancies between how they how the plan is presented and what it will actually be it i mean it looks good on paper but once it's in existence it won't look good one of the things that the the discussion about a third floor or having three floors which would be on you, you wouldn't be able to do that. The basement garage is not counted as a floor because it's mostly below the average of the current of, of the proposed development. But if you look on page A21, it shows the existing the the basement is mostly out of the ground. So it really does count as a floor, which makes from the front, it's going to look like a three-story building, even though it is a basement, but it is almost entirely out of the ground. So that alone makes it outsized for any other house on the street. No other house other than 193, 195, which is this really outsized property on the street. No other house looks like that. So it would destroy the character of the neighborhood of modest-sized homes. I mean, again, you know, none of us had any adequate time to get representation. I mean, I don't even know if I'm speaking to this correctly because I've never, I've never worked on a on a zoning appeal. So, I mean, I just want to say that I am opposed, um, and that's that's my piece. Perfect. <clears throat> no, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I right. appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on the list is um, Eric Aronow. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so I live at 129 Newland Road, so I'm not an abutter, but uh, you know, walking out my front door, I basically see, you know, you know, walking out my front door, looking to the right, I see the following views. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to share my screen. Oh. Looks like uh, screen sharing is not allowed. 
Um, I can ask one? though if um, Rick, if, could you possibly? Uh, Mr. Chairman, he should be all set. Good. Thank you, Rick. All right. Let me try it now. No, it looks like it's still disabled. Eric, give me one second. Okay. Okay, try that. Okay. You're, you're good to go. Okay, so this is the view, actually, this is not my view, but this is the view from KC Connolly, or KC Catholic Connolly's uh, back, backyard currently. And uh, you can see the, the, the small house that is currently there. You can see across to Layla's house, uh, which is the, the high one that you're seeing over the, over the low, uh, uh, I guess that's like an enclosed porch there. Uh, you can also see several trees that are, that are there in their yard. So, you know, that would perhaps address part of Mr. Moore's question. Um, and you can see that, um, you know, the, the house as it is, is pretty much at a, at a level with, with, with Casey's house, it's slightly, it's slightly lo lower than, than the, the house of, uh, of, of Layla. Uh, and now I'm going to show you what I did is I, I, I did an uh, overlay, you know, basically putting it to the scale of the current house of the drawings. And so, this is this is what the new house would uh, would, would look like, you know, by comparison, and it's over, overlaid over the same exact spot. Again, I'll, I'll go back and forth between the two. This is the existing. This is the proposed. So you can see from the from the perspective of of KC, this is this is essentially uh, a seventy foot wall. That's going up, and it's going, you know, seventy feet long and about thirty-two feet high. Um, and then this is the view from the street currently. You can see Layla's uh, Layla Niles Moore's house in the uh, in the uh, Layla Moore Niles uh, in, in the in the in, in the middle. You can see the the monstrosity that was built illegally a few years ago, and this is the the current house. So you know, right, and you know, so you, you can see that. Again, the current house and Layla's house look to be pretty much on a on a scale with each other. Okay, now this is the overlay of the the new house you know, as as it would be. Um, so um, you, know, the, you know now uh, with that with Layla's house would essentially be inside a canyon uh, between these two enormous houses. So that's the. So that's the the first point that I would like to make. Um, and if anyone wants to you know to review these uh, again, I can I can switch between them. Uh, the, the second point that I would like to make is that looking over the plans, it seems to me that um, this really looks more like it's a tear down and a and a kind of complete rebuilding of a new house. Um, I'm I'm curious as to which walls would actually be preserved to make this an addition and not just a tear down and rebuild. Mm -hmm. um, especially you know, as they're putting in uh, putting in a, 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 a driveway underneath the house, um, and uh, from what I had heard, that the existing foundation is 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 also has also got a lot of problems, which was you know part of why the the, the property went for cheaper. So I so I guess you know I, I would like to ask that question about the you know, mm. you know what walls are going to be preserved to make this an addition and not. Uh, and 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 not a not a complete rebuild or not a complete tear down. And um, the third question, uh, third thing, do you remember what it was? <laughs> all of a sudden, all of a sudden, my mind goes blank on the third on the third point. But uh, uh, it was all, also the um, I, I think that there's something misleading about the the height um, you know the height claims here, and that is that. Uh, if you base the height on the average grade, but you're building 50 feet back up a 15% grade, you're adding uh, 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 perhaps four or five feet to the average grade. So that means that although you're maybe going to be a 32 foot house from the average grade, from the front of the house, you're probably adding 10 feet or more. And I wouldn't be surprised if the measurement from the front of the house to the peak of the house is closer to 36 or 37 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And the one other point that uh, John had brought up when, when he and I were talking earlier was that uh, the drainage from, uh, from Brand Street, which is behind, uh, behind all of this, um, is, is, is very poorly done so that when there's, there are heavy rains, there's essentially a river coming down what is now the driveway of, uh, of 189. And if that, uh, you know, the, if that isn't dealt with in some way that's not going to be making things worse, then uh, it's definitely going to be causing huge problems. You shouldn't, so you need to not only consider the, the drainage off of the roof of this house, but you also need to config, uh, consider the effect of the, 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 the water that's coming down uh, naturally from, from behind this, coming, coming down from Brand Street. So I, I would like to get an answer to that question about what, what walls would be preserved you know, that would make this an addition and not a rebuild. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can ask you to release your screen share. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I, I wonder if, uh, I just wanted to say this before we, I forget, before we move on. Uh, but it would be helpful if uh, Mr. Aronow would uh, submit the material he just presented to us uh, for the record, so that we can, uh, 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 so that we we can follow it. Otherwise, it's just a demonstrative in the hearing, and and people who don't see the recording won't see it. I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go ahead and just share the floor plans again, and then if I could ask the applicant if they could um, to show what what is existing and what is where's the this sort of the change. Yeah, they, they uh, so go ahead. Ha happy to address that. So uh, all the walls of the cellar would be, remain. All the walls of the first floor, with the exception of the rear wall, would remain. The walls on the second floor. We would ideally keep the front and right and left walls uh, and extend them up to the new gable, uh, to the base of the new gable. Um, there's, when we've done that before, we've had different kinds of luck. So there's a possibility that we would have to remove the walls of the second floor in order to kind of more cleanly support the gable. But the current intention is that we would keep the um, front, right, and left walls of the first floor and uh, second floor, and then build the extension behind that. So that that's how, uh, we don't mean to be disingenuous. Our intention is to keep the keep the building as it is. We're not changing the floor to floor height. So with the windows uh, on those walls, we've worked to preserve um, because we want this to be, to fit into the fabric as it, as it has um, along the street. Okay, so just to, to the, the basement, we're, we believe is, is remaining as as is, and then at the first floor level, um, it's just the the larger opening between what's the existing house and the proposed what is the only part of that wall that's being removed. But the rest of that is essentially is the same. The second floor of framing is the same, and then above the second floor, um, it's more a structural question as to whether the existing walls can be maintained or if they have to be replaced because you're raising the roof. Right, correct. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, just briefly go back to Mr. Aaron now, do you, um, did you have any further questions? I know you. Yeah, I mean, just sort of the, one of the thing that made me wonder about that is uh, one of the pages there was uh, the, the, the side view it looked like the distance from the basement window uh, up to the first floor window was different from the existing house to the you know, to the proposed. So I, you know, uh, that that made me question it. You know, but if you're saying that the those those walls will be left as is, you know, I'll, I'll I'll believe you. That's the intention. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arnau. Um Next is uh, Melanie and Andrew Jarbo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, to the board. Um, we uh, live across the street at 200 Forest Street, 
we're actually across from that large um, double uh, wide structure that Mr. Arno showed in his photos. That's directly to the left of um, Layla's house at 191. Um, we urge the board to either deny the special permit um, on the grounds that it is in fact detrimental to the neighborhood or um, as the abutters have suggested to defer a decision until the abutters um, and the neighbors can get some expert advice and perhaps retain counsel. Um, I'll note three particular concerns, um, two of which have been discussed, so I will note them briefly. First, the drainage. Um, Forest Street is a significant hill um, during storms. You can see drainage coming down anywhere that there is a hill, down the street, down the driveways, down the roads. We all have wet basements, um, and this is a significant concern, decreasing the permeable space um, anywhere near the street. Um, the, the fact that the, the um, applicants are concerned with the front view, the sort of um, curb appeal of the structure is laudable. Um, we, we certainly look at that view every day. We appreciate the fact that they're concerned um, that the view from the street be attractive. However, building up and back to such a significant extent, essentially tripling the size of the property, really impacts the abutter's ability, especially, you know, 185 and 187 certainly, but especially 191 for us, that's Layla's house, the gray one in the middle, um, their ability to really get adequate light and air. This is basic, this is basic turn of the century zoning that everybody needs to be able to enjoy their property. They need to be able to get adequate sunlight and fresh air. Um, the, the, the large, large structure to the northwest of 191 Forest is huge. Um, it is well dwarfs Layla's house. It um, her her roof is much much lower than it, and this this new proposed structure will also um, really block out her light and her air. Um, and also, it's it's very close, um, 12 feet away. That's 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 incredibly close. Um, and finally, you know, something that hasn't really, really been mentioned, but this house backs up um, into Turkey Hill, which is a part of Arlington that um, is home to a lot of wildlife, a lot of vegetation, um, and to, to further decrease this very valuable open space from a drainage perspective, from a wildlife perspective, from a vegetation perspective, would be really unfortunate and absolutely would um, negatively impact both the neighborhood, the people, right, and the ecosystem. Um, so again, we would just urge the board to either deny um, the special permit or defer this decision um, until uh, the applicants can answer some of these very critical questions that they do not seem to have an answer to. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, next is uh, Marlene Silva. Thank you. Uh, Marlene Silva, Newland Road, Arlington, Precinct 19 town meeting member. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I oppose this proposal as submitted. This has negative impact to the abutters and the neighborhood. First of all, the neighbors need time greater than four days to understand the impact. And the ZBA also must more clearly explain if we are increasing the nonconformity of a nonconforming lot and structure. I think that's really important to get more clarity on. The actual slope must be evaluated because I really am confused at what buildable space is on the slope as stated. Um, also, a tree plan. The developer stated tonight he would just cut down some trees in the back. Um, there must be a tree plan, an impervious surface plan, a drainage plan, and an impact study for sunlight too for the abutting neighbors. It's really hard to see a structure like this go be proposed without an understanding of impact. Um, again, I do oppose this as it is currently submitted. Additionally, it is not in keeping with the scale of the neighborhood. I understand towns change, but we have to understand that this isn't in keeping with this neighborhood, and it also doesn't bring affordable housing to Arlington, and it 
just doesn't help this in any aspect. I hope you'll consider to um, allow neighbors to have a greater time to study this. And thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, next is uh, Kim Fan Savage. Hi, thank you. Yes, Kim Van Savage. I um, am not in a butter. I live around the corner on Park Ave Extension and the corner of Forest Street. And I'm familiar with the neighborhood because I'm out walking my dog and all of the streets around the neighborhood and have gotten to know and understand to a certain extent the character um, of the neighborhood. I think as everybody's saying, there hasn't been a lot of time to look at this. I actually um, looked at the information that was provided yesterday and was really trying to figure out how do you make decisions like this? And I noticed, you know, the criteria for approval of a special permit specifically states that the benefits of the pro proposed project must outweigh its adverse effects. And so through this, I've been thinking about, okay, so far I've got a long list of adverse effects. <laughs> There's the green space, environmental issues, the very clear and detrimental impact to the abutters, character of the neighborhood, as we've all spoken about. Um, and it goes on and on. There's going to be a longer list by the end of everybody's participation in this conversation. So then I'm trying to go to what are the benefits of the project. So from what I can tell, and this could turn into a question um, for the developers, because there may be more, um, but what I understand or conjecture of the benefits are number one, increased property tax base for Arlington. Um, that's one thing that could help us, huge benefit for all. Um, increased developer profit, um, which is why a lot of these construction projects go up. Um, the developer very specifically states that housing is a benefit in the application, mentions housing as one of the benefits. Um, and only tonight, the developer mentioned that um, getting rid of an eyesore was a benefit, but that wasn't in the application. So I would say providing housing is a benefit. Um, eliminating an eyesore, doing some renovation is a benefit. Both of those things can be done without applying for the special permit um, is what I would propose. So again, I'm struggling with what the benefits are. And that if it is, I'm assuming that it's the developer's responsibility to share with us those benefits. It didn't come across to me in the application and I want a lot more information in that area. I, I also just want to note, people have mentioned it, um, a couple of places in the, in the application, they mention that um, it maintains the character because it is a single family home. And I think that all of us who walk through this neighborhood know that providing a single family alone does not necessarily maintain the character of the neighborhood, as you've noted by one of the new housing, uh, as other people have described as monstrosities um, in the neighborhood. So I, I guess that's my comment. Throughout the night, I'm going to be listening. I'm going to think about what are the adverse impacts, what are the benefits, and I, it, so far to me, it's weighing towards the adverse impacts. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you. Appreciate thank you. Your participation. Um, would you mind if I uh, address a few of these comments? Because um, I, I do think that you know I, there's some val validity to them, but I would kind of I think if we could color in a little bit of this, it might help explain how we got where we are. Is that all right? Um, you can either do it now or if you'd rather wait till we have all the comments in. I, I'm I'm a little concerned that we're going to hear the same comment from a bunch of people. Okay. And, and we, this might help them kind of understand it rather than us make the comment, uh, respond to the comment more times, um, if that's all right. Yeah. So I to take a take a few minutes to respond to a few of the the concerns that have been raised. Sure. Just, just really quickly, um, one comment that's brought brought up a bunch of times and is very important to us is that is the drainage uh, of the site. And just so people understand, right now there is a drainage issue, and there may be a drainage issue on other sites when we're done with this. Um, 
but part of the problem is that there, most of the sites around here have not done a drainage plan or have not done one in a long time. We would, as we're doing this, have to um, take that into consideration. We would have to drain our building and um, and any pervious surface uh, and con contain that within our lot. And that might actually have some knock-on benefits for some of the projects downhill from us because we're going to end up collecting some of that water too as part of what happens here. So I think, you know, I agree that drainage is a concern and it's just not something that we at this stage in the game would have put together a drainage plan for, but something that we would have to work with the city on if this were approved. So that, that's, I, I appreciate that and I don't want to say it's not an issue. I just want to let you know that we do actually, we have thought about that. The other thing that I think is, um, the two other really quick points. The, one of them is that um, barring the special permit, this project is zoning compliant. It meets the height, it meets the FAR, it is a single family on this site. So that's how we got to this point. We're not, we didn't feel like we were kind of uh, asking for the world. We, this is, this is what the zoning code implies for this site. And it, it may seem long to you, but the site is 300 feet long. Um, we are not, we're not, um, extending beyond the uh, the setbacks or the existing setbacks. So I, I know that may not make it make you feel a lot better, but this is this is what the site is is zoned for. And then thirdly, I apologize to anybody who didn't get a notice. We we filed our uh, application in November thirtieth. Um, so we did not mean to surprise anybody by having this this hearing tonight. I, um, but so you know. That being, I just wanted to point out those three things, um, and you may still continue to comment on them, but I wanted to let you know that, that we're not not listening. All right. Thank you for that. Um, uh, going back to the, the public speakers list, um, uh, Christina Smaraglia. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chair, board uh, applicants. I'm Christina Smaraglia. I'm at 164 Forest Street, so down the street. Um, I do want to say I appreciate the consideration um, that the applicants have made for keeping the aesthetic from the street, uh, similar to the you know existing house. Um, I do hope, though, that the board will defer decision um, for a few reasons. As, as others have mentioned, um, a tree plan, as well as a water drainage study seem important, um, and it seems that those should be done before making a decision rather than after approval. Uh, I also want to make a note about the overall size. Um, while I realize this um, may be within the um, allowable size for the zone, um, Arlington really is in, in desperate need of modestly sized and starter homes and not large, expensive single family homes. And the proposed development will just contribute to that problem, um, decreasing the very important stock of small and moderately sized housing. Um, certainly, I think some increase in square footage from the original is reasonable. Um, it was it was very small to start with, so I can understand wanting to put an addition on. Um, but it doesn't seem that it needs to be nearly as large as what's currently being proposed. So I think that's a consideration as well. Um, one question that I have, my only question is whether shade studies um, have been done for this, given the potential impact on the adjacent homes, um, especially with the narrow lots. And I'm thinking in particular of Layla's um, home, which we've talked about um, before, um, and the solar panels on that side of her property, which um, you could actually see in, in Eric's photos. Thank you. Um... So shade studies have not been done so far, but that is certainly that something that the board could um, consider requesting from the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Deborah Duque. Hi, good evening. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to everybody that's come. Um, I'm, a, I'm not one of the close neighbors, but I do. Sorry, I just need you to verify your name and address oh, for the record. Bigger sorry, brain. yes, Deborah Duguay at 25 Dartmouth Street in Arlington. Thank you. And um, I know I know Layla's property well, 
and from standing in her backyard and imagining this gigantic house next door, she's kind of not going to have a backyard. Um, and I, I feel like it's really unfair for one property owner to be able to create something that's going to so severely impact another property owner. Um, that's that's one concern I've got. And then an, another one is really about the environmental impacts with the runoff issues. While at the same time, the town of Arlington has been investing lots of money and effort to you know, mitigating the climate change issues of runoff and too much water and so forth. Um, so it, it seems really in conflict with that. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is uh, Stephen Chasen. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, and thank you. I'm Stephen Chason. I live at 124 Newland Road, which is uh, just down uh, a few houses on Newland Road from, uh, from where Ms. Conley and Ms. Niles live. And I'm a neighbor and, and, and friend of both of them. Uh, and they are, of course, the owners of the homes on each side of this, this proposed new construction. Uh, I want to join in their objections as the proposed project is one which is entirely inconsistent with the character of the neighborhood and the other concerns that they've expressed, including, I think, very importantly, the hydrology and stormwater issues. Um, the proposed home would be entirely out of scale with other homes in the neighborhood. <sighs> Separate and apart from these objections and as discussed by Ms. Conley and Ms. Niles at length, they have not had uh, or they've not received adequate notice of the plan of development and accordingly they are effectively being deprived of an opportunity to be heard in this proceeding. Uh, I'm a lawyer. They contacted me on a Saturday after finding out about what the plans were. That's when they were posted on the website and um, I don't practice in the area of zoning law but I do know uh, a lawyer that does that I've worked with in the past. Uh, his name is Bruce Fitzsimmons. He's here in Arlington. Um, I spoke to him Monday afternoon after hearing from Layla and, uh, and KC. And uh, unfortunately, um, on such short notice, he couldn't even meet with them before this hearing, uh, much less review all the documents that he would have had to review to be uh, prepared to represent them. Uh, however, uh, he has indicated that he will be available to represent them. And I believe that it's likely uh, that they will be, retain him to do so. Uh, obviously, Ms. Niles and Ms. Conley have not had a reasonable opportunity to consult with a lawyer and potentially a civil engineer or other appropriate professionals to advise them on the myriad issues and the potential legal ob uh, objections they could raise to this project. Um, further, the required report uh, from the Department of Planning and Community Development as required by Rule 2.46 uh, was not even posted until today on the town website, as you've noted, Mr. Chairman, not until late this afternoon. Uh, again, one wonders how people in the position of Ms. Conley and Ms. Niles can be expected to respond effectively to the request for a special permit when such critical information is not provided until the last minute. Now, we're not trying to imply that there's anything intentional here being done by the town. I'm sure there are circumstances that explain why it, it, this information wasn't provided until so late, but it's an important consideration. And in light of all the objections that have been raised uh, today, uh, the board should deny the request for special permit at this time, I believe. However, if the board is at all inclined to grant a special permit, at a minimum, I think a continuance of approximately 30 days to allow Ms. Conley and Ms. Niles and others who may be interested in retaining counsel to obtain proper consultation and legal advice, uh, that should be allowed, I, I believe. And the board is respectfully requested to do so, to grant that continuance under rule 3.6.1. Um, I think as a matter of fundamental fairness, at a minimum, uh, that continuance should be allowed um, to, to give them adequate notice and an opportunity to be heard. 
the fact that they're present by video tonight is not an opportunity to be heard because they have not had sufficient notice to allow them to prepare for this hearing by obtaining legal and professional advice as to the issues that are being addressed here tonight. Um, and as a point of order, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we respectfully request that the board inquire as to the Department of Planning and Community Development representative whether it is in the normal course to issue its report on the day of the hearing on the special permit, or if not, what the usual practice is as to how much notice is provided to the community and to the people whose rights are being impacted by, by this type of uh, decision. Uh, finally, it's respectfully requested. Um, I, I didn't know until this evening that this, this uh, proceeding is being recorded, but I know that there are typically minutes of the hearing provided, and I would request that the minutes of the hearing specifically include the objections that have been raised as to the unfairness to Ms. Niles and Ms. Conley with regard to the release of the plans um, at such a late time by the Department of Planning and also the late uh, timing of the release by the town of the actual building plans, uh, which we now find out tonight were apparently submitted to the town uh, at least a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we believe that that deprived them of the opportunity to obtain effective legal advice. And I would just respectfully request that the minutes reflect that those objections have been watched tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And we will take note of, of that as well. Um, next on the list is uh, Jessica Grill. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, so I live at, my name is Jessica Grill. I live at 181 Forest Street. So I'm two down from the property. Um, my house sits back off the road and just, I've had two occurrences that, so people have said, I anticipate this will cause. I am kind of proof that it, it will cause difficulties. I, my house was very small. It was a two room house that got built onto when we poured a new foundation. Um, it was uh, flooded with water. We had all our new furniture down there and things like that. It was waist deep in water. And that was before uh, the people on Brand Street rerouted the water to come down through our house. So I'm like one over and back from 189. Um, the other thing that I'm concerned about on behalf of uh, John and his family is I have neighbors on either side of my long, steep driveway. The pictures did not indicate that Eric Aronow showed just how steep those driveways are, and that shows the grade of the house. Um, you know, I do think it's wonderful that if the building of this new house can help remediate some of the, the water that runs into the road and then freezes, um, which makes it dangerous to even drive. People can't even get up Forest Street when there's bad weather, it just happened the other night. Um, but so on the on either side of my driveway, I had one neighbor who without any illegally put up a wall on the side of the driveway, both at the bottom and at the top, and a new neighbor just put up a wall on the other side, I have nowhere to put my snow. Um, and it's a very, very steep driveway. Um, so it's not like I can walk it up or down because I'm sliding down at that point. And I'm concerned that something similar will happen to John with a retaining wall that will be put up on that side. Um, so I just, those are kind of the two real life experiences. Um, we obviously welcome new neighbors. It's a very friendly neighborhood, um, but there are definitely concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so looking back on the list, there are no new names, um, but there are a couple of names who are um, on for a second time. So first would be uh, Layla Niles for a second. I, I don't know. Anyway, can you hear me? There you go. We can. Okay, sorry. No, no, no. Also, you know, I appreciate that, you know, the, the, the concerns were, were addressed by Eric. Um, but, but the, the, 
you know, our current intention is not to take down the walls. I don't believe it was the intention of the developer at 193, 195 Forest Street to, to tear the house down. And the house, which was historical, disappeared. So I also know that they made a drainage plan and their drainage plan pumps, I think it's a, a perimeter drain. I don't know the exact name of the pump that comes up. It goes down, comes up, goes down again. And it's right outside my left dining room window. There's two of them. And since that has been put in, I've received water on the left side of my basement consistently. And all the other runoff goes down into this pipe that then people have mentioned floods the sidewalk on the north side of forestry. It's like a it's like a skating rink. So these issues are exacerbated by, you know, like Jessica said, I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I think the, the the drainage issue is huge. And with a almost 3,000 square foot house, the rain will not go in the in the ground anymore. It's already pretty bad when it goes in the ground. It's now going to go off the roof on both sides into my yard. And then John and Casey will get the rest of it. So I, I really just, I just hope you reject this proposal. It's too big. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll uh, give Eric Aaron now for a second. Uh, yeah. Uh, another uh, thing that I was wondering about was, uh, don't know to what extent the 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 builders know or the developers know about the fact that all of this all of these houses are built on ledge and uh, so i was wondering whether your foundations you know whether there would be any cracking of ledge that that you've anticipated or that you know, how how would you address that just because cracking of ledge can cause uh cracks in the in the neighboring foundations especially uh if it's so close uh, and then the other question that I have uh, is how do I how do I post those pictures? How do I attach them to the agenda? Um, if I can answer the second one first. Um, so if the pictures, if you can email them to the board's address, which is uh, zba at town dot arlington dot ma dot us, um, then we will get those posted. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Thank and you. then for the first question, I would uh, go back to the applicant. Um, have you done any subsurface testing for location mm -hmm. of ledge? And do you have a sense as to what you're going to need to do to prepare the site? We we haven't um, done much as far as subsurface test um, search, but we also are not uh, actually cutting into the ledge very or cutting into the ground very far. Um, if you'll notice, like the back of the building is about three feet into the ground and we don't anticipate a foundation more than four feet um, below that um, and maybe we might even step it so that's less than four feet so we're we're not uh, the the intention and the seller does not expand backwards and the first floor extends back kind of to where we felt it would be without having to do much um, subsurface work so we we haven't but we also don't anticipate going deep into the hill or going for you know it's kind of mm -hmm. Um, skirts up the hill and you can see that on like our a one a21 sheet which kind of shows the, the building in section and our a22 like the the building does not sit very far into the ground okay and then as far as um as drainage is concerned if if you're going to be required to um you know to the water that and that come that you have to deal with the water that's on your site without mm -hmm. allowing it to leave and you're going to be doing infiltration how does the the presence of you know ledge potentially near the surface impact your ability to do that? Yeah, it, that's definitely uh, tricky because we don't want to create we don't want to dig too into the ledge uh, to create an infiltration system. It wouldn't wouldn't particularly work well. We'd have to look at potentially doing something um, even under the uh, the uh, impervious uh, pervious dri uh, driveway towards the front of the site. Um, or along the um, the nine foot wide site um, uh, adjacent to our neighbor, where we have a little bit of space, we'd have to do something kind of long and narrow in there. But um, we'd have to bring the civil engineer could speak to that more than I can. 
and we'll get one. Okay, great, thank you. Um, um, and then um, have somebody who's new to the list, uh, so we'll go with uh, to Jennifer Tidwell. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Jennifer Tidwell, uh, married to Rich Carrero. Uh, we are neighbors up the hill on Forest Street. We're at 211. Um, so we're not direct butters, but um, we're going to pass the site every single day. Um, so, I mean, most of my concerns have already been raised by most of the people that have spoken. Um, and I absolutely concur on these issues, especially with the hydrology. Um, I'm very worried, especially about the front of that house. Um, you were talking about a pervious surface for the uh, for the driveway. I think it's going to be very important. Um, that's downhill of everything on that site. And you're going to need that space to absorb the storm water. So I absolutely want to see some assurance that uh, the storm water is being handled appropriately for something of this size. Um, other um, other issues, um, like many of you, I also think that the size, sheer size of this house is completely out of scale with um, the other houses around it, especially uh, Layla at uh, 191. Um, I've taken this plot plan and projected it sort of onto, um, using Arlington's GPS um, data, I've, I've projected onto, you know, um, aerial views of this neighborhood, and it is going to extend so far past her, the, her back door it's gonna block all the morning sun from her back door, all of it. And it, it's gonna be 20 plus feet above grade at that point. Um, plus she has that other huge, huge house on the other side. It's not fair. It's really not fair to her to, to, uh, to put something of that size there. So on that, on that basis alone, I hope you decline this permit. Um, finally, um, I, like many others, want to see a tree plan. I hate to go by some of these houses that are being rebuilt or renovated and seeing so many trees being torn down. Um, Arlington needs its tree cover. Um, it's important to the town to have a good tree canopy. And it is particularly important to this neighborhood. It's part of the character of our neighborhood to have these big trees. So I really want to know what the developer wants to do and plans to do with these trees. So, all right, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so with that, um, we have Stephen Chasen for a second. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to ask, um, uh, I, I requested earlier uh, the point of order as to whether or not the community, Department of Planning usually issues its report sooner. You no, beg your pardon. I'm sorry? Uh, beg your pardon. I had forgotten you had asked that. Um, so this is something that the board has um, has sort of struggled with over time. Um, it is a it's a coordination between a couple of different departments to get that done. Um, and at the moment, uh, as, as, well, as of Monday, the, the staffing is a little bit better, but um, the Department of Planning and Community Development has been understaffed um, for at least uh, the last couple of months. Um, obviously, it's, it's it's not a you know not an excuse in this in this particular case, um, but this is something that the board has recognized and has been trying to work with the Department um, of Planning and Community Development to address and to come up with ways that we can streamline the process. We can get these earlier. Um, this is exceptionally late. Um, it is often that we will receive the report uh, at the end of the week prior. Um, we sometimes receive them the day before, uh, but this is exceptionally late. Um, and you know, as has been noted by several people, um, you know, really, you know, is, is unfair to the public, but you know, it's unfair to the board as well. We've barely had time to look at it too. Okay, um, I just want you know, I understand, and and I'm not trying to uh, throw you know bombs at anybody, but. I just think that it's further indication, as I said before, um, out of respect for fairness for the process and, and the people that are impacted by the decision of this board, I think it's a strong further indication of the propriety of a brief continuance for 30 days or so mm -hmm. um, for, for them to have the opportunity to, to show the plans and, and the, the planning department's report uh, to people that can uh, advise them uh, with with a much 
better knowledge base as to what is and what is not uh, appropriate under the circumstances. Thank you. Um, Mr. Moore for a second. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm wondering, is it is it within the uh, ZBA's purview to perhaps require a drainage study or some sort of drainage plan prior to approving a project? I know that sounds a whole lot like it's cart before the horse because mm -hmm. you're not going to approve a project. Why would you have someone do a drainage plan? But that seems to be one of the very consistent points of concern here by all of the abutters and neighbors is the drainage here. Um, and is there any method for doing that? That's question number one. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very interesting question, one I had not considered before. Um, typically, if there's a situation where we are concerned about drainage, we do apply it as a condition to the, the permit that a, you know, that a properly engineered uh, drainage plan be prepared and reviewed and approved by the engineering division. Um, but I don't think apart from, you know, comprehensive permit applications um, that we have typically requested that because it's, we're not in a position to approve a drainage plan. We're just in a position to, you know, to, to look at it, but we, we don't have the expertise to approve it. Right, Mr. Chair, that does that does that does make sense. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, I wonder if I, you know, I've been struggling with the same issue all evening, um, and we obviously can't approve the plan. Um, the question actually is whether or not there's any plan. At least a question is whether there's any plan that the town engineer can approve. And you know, if we aren't convinced that at least this is doable. Um, whether or not it's specifically done, and, and but if we're not convinced that it's doable at all, so that we aren't sure that even if the rules that are provided in the that apply to the, the town engineer can matter, we may take that into account in applying rule. Uh, excuse me, implying section 3.3. 3. Uh, and also, I, let me point out that the applicable section is actually a section on large additions which is more specific than the general provisions on uh, on uh, uh, on uh, special permits and which are specifically addressed the, the kind of situation where something may be extended uh, in a way that c complies with the zoning bylaw, but nevertheless, because of the way it's set or because of other specific site specific conditions and conditions relating to the specific properties that are nearby um, that it's inappropriate to grant the permit. So, you know, the reason we have a special provision on large additions uh, is precisely to deal with the kind of site specific issues and issues on immediate abutters that, um, that we've heard a lot about tonight. So all of this is 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 very relevant and i'm not sure exactly how far we go or what kind of advice we can have and i think we need to sort of think about that but i wouldn't rule out any kind of inquiry at this point at least the kind of inquiry to give us some confidence that this is something that in the normal course of things can be worked out thank you mr hanlon mr moore uh thank you thanks those comments uh help a lot mr hanlon i appreciate that um the, the last, the only question I have left is um, logistically with a, if, if the plan moves forward with a, a addition of this size, how is all of the heavy equipment required to pour foundations, to do whatever is required back there, going to access the rear of the site without impinging on the neighbors? I mean, I assume they'd have to use the driveway, which is going to be torn up eventually, but uh, there's, there's almost no there, and I'm concerned that the trees, which are all along the edge, will be killed in the process, even regardless of, of protection measures that might get taken. There are, they are protected trees. I, it's hard to tell if they're on the property, which property line they're on, but I'm, I'm pretty concerned about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, OK. 
Okay, so I have gone through everybody. There's nobody else who wants to speak for first time. There's nobody else who wants to speak for second time. I have two hands who've spoken twice. I'm not sure if they are newly raised or still raised from earlier. Um, so I will just briefly ask, uh, Mr. Chason, is this a new comment or is your hand just still raised? No, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. No, that's okay. Uh, and then the same question for Ms. Niles. Um, did you have I, a, something further? Yes, please. Yes, I have. Um, I'm concerned about the trees also because, again, there's this very vague talk about, well, we'll take care of the trees. Um, I have a, I believe it's a cherry tree. I don't really know what it is, but I really enjoy it. It's right outside my kitchen window. Half of it might be on the property of 189. What's going to happen to that tree? And honestly, I mean, I feel that the drainage is a huge issue. I also feel that the developers haven't addressed my lack of sunlight. This is going to be a wall, a wall from seeing my neighbors, John and Casey a wall blocking sunlight. And I, those trees that I'm sure are gonna get destroyed, John said I could tap and I've tapped before. So it's like, this is really diminishing my property and life and nobody seems to really get it. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very upset. I'm very tired. I've been reading over these papers for days and trying to work. So I, really, really encourage with all the thoughtful comments, why not reject it and then reevaluate later? Thank you very much. I won't speak again. Thank you. Ms. Niles. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, next on the list is Amy Cooper for first time. Hi there, um, Amy Cooper. I'm sorry, I can't get my camera to work properly, but I live on James Street in Arlington um, and know a lot of these neighbors. I pass down Forest Street a lot and uh, love our town. And I do agree with all these comments about this property just being way too big and um, would hate to see it go in at this size. And I agree with Layla that it should just be outright rejected. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then Ms. Tidwell for a second. Okay, I hope this is a small comment. Um, and maybe this has been addressed, so correct me if it has. Mm -hmm. um, on the, in the pack that was sent out, um, the first uh, page, it says request for special permit. Um, it uh, says the applicant requests, uh, uh, the addition will make the house about 2,500 square feet with three bedrooms and two and a half baths. Um, is that is that a wrong number? Um, and, is, and does the applicant plan to correct that? Uh, if I could ask the applicant, twenty five hundred square feet. What is the correct square footage? It looks like it's twenty eight hundred plus, depending on how you uh, measure it. Okay. Um, There's a worksheet. If I could ask the applicant to answer that question as to what the Actual, let's see, 2957. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, um, the, uh, the proposed gross floor area is 2957. And part of that is porch, right? Balcony. Um, no, GFA is GFA. Gross floor is. Yeah. It's, it does not include the porch. Okay. In any case, I can't, I can't find any math that makes it come out to 2,500 square feet. Um, it, when I first read the special permit, I saw that and I thought, oh, 2,500 isn't so bad. But then I continued to read. Um, I feel like that number is misleading, if not outright wrong. I, I, I would you. agree with you. I'm not sure where you see the 2,500 square feet. Um, but um, I, I believe it is 2957. The second page of the PDF that was uh, sent out. 
That's on the first page of the application, the front page of the application. The top of the page says request for special permit town of Arlington. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's probably just a mistake, but at least for me, it put my back up. It made me feel like there might be other things in here that might be hidden that I wasn't seeing. It did not incline uh, yeah. me to look well upon the permit. I, I apologize. The draft I'm looking at doesn't actually list any area on the front page. So I'd have to see um, the package that was sent out and see if, because uh, this is an earlier draft and I don't have the uh, final mm -hmm. that we sent out on November 30th in front of me. Mm. But it is 2957 currently. There's a stamp on the page that says November 28th, 2022. Huh. I can settle this offline. I can show you what I have, um, but no, I we will I take up any more of the meeting time for this. We'll pick up with it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, apologies for any inconsistency. Were there any other members of the public wishing to address this permit? Excuse me, this application? I do not see any. So I will go ahead and close the public. Oh, sorry, comment. sorry. Oh. I just, I am joining a little bit late. So, um, hi, I'm Drew. I live on Forestry. I don't know if I've, um, if this has already been covered because I just am joining now so please tell me if it's not but just was wondering how much um uh how much kind of what's this going to do to our to the uh just the normal functioning around our area just so you know thinking about um how long the build is going to take uh where all of the trucks are going to park uh how much noise is it going to cause if I've got small children at home that live here so is there going to be hammering during their nap time and are we not going to be able to go up and down our road because we're building this massive house on it mm -hmm. um i live on the corner of huntington and forest so um, are we going to have trucks just parked on our road for six months now and blocking all of our parking spots and blocking our driveways or the yeah so i don't know if those mm -hmm. things have came up apologies if they have no um there was some brief comment question about um, how to access the rear of the lot for construction, um, but not specifically for um, you know sort of the the construction coordination and what the impacts of those will be. Yeah. Um, I could ask that the applicant if they have a sense as to how long the construction period would be. Um, we would anticipate about four to six months once uh, we pull the permit. Okay. From when to when? It's from obviously condition, weather condition. Hope we're not going to be in the bad weather once we start building this, obviously, if, if it does get approved. So, but realistically, it would be from start, meaning like day one, start to finish, and you're from four to six months, just depending on how challenging, um, you know, the site's going to get. Um, but in terms of getting in the back of uh, the building, we have absolutely no worries. Um, we're very um, well diverse um, developers. We've built much, much bigger, much bigger buildings and smaller um, lots in Boston and around. So um, in terms of getting in the back, uh, even porn foundation, there's pumps that you can do so you don't have to bring in. <clears throat> big trucks in the back um so we, we would obviously abide by all town and inspectional services um rules and regulations um even times of construction and stuff like that so but in terms of parking we have plenty of we feel like we have enough space to um not use um street parking um so i i don't think you will have trucks parked in front of your house um, so where where will you park all of these cars to take down an entire house and build a new one uh, not, Carlos, they, not taking down a, a whole house and again it's it's not like a house gets built uh everyone's there at once doing all different trades it gets built in stages mm -hmm. um so there's not you know at, at most we would have you know even framing would have four to five guys there framing 
um, pouring foundation that's two to three guys at a time. So again, we're not anticipating having, you know, 15, 20 people at once um, putting this together. So do you anticipate closing now? If, if you could, if you, Mr. Carlos, if you could just address questions to, to me as chair and then I can- Oh, sorry, Christian. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. It's Calaris. Um, okay. So do they anticipate closing down Forest Street at all during that four to six months? I do not believe they are, no. Okay. Um, and do they anticipate uh, unusual amount of noise and commotion during daytime hours? for folks um, that work at home and people who have small children? So there was a question about whether or not they would need to do anything in regards to uh, ledge. Um, and they had indicated that the, the reason for partly for the way that things are designed was to avoid having to get into any ledge um, that might exist on the site, uh, assuming that they have not though done a, a thorough uh, subsurface evaluation. So we have the possible locations of ledge have not been fully identified. Um, and then so that if assuming that there is no ledge, then it would just be standard um, construction um, going on during the, the times that the, the town allows under the noise ordinance and the bylaw. So it would be, you know, framing, you know, pneumatic framing guns would probably be the, the loudest um, apart from when they're, you know, any concrete trucks or something like that, that may be on the site momentarily, you know, for a shorter period of time. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, I have a new name on the, we'd like to address, uh, it's Beverly Subaru. Yes, I'm here. Um, you could give your name, name and address Shibru. for the record, please. My name is Beverly Subaru and I live at 137 Newland Road. Um, just two houses away from where the construction would be um, in on Newland. <clears throat> I've lived there 51 years. Previous to that, my grandfather had the house built in um, 1931. So we've been longstanding neighbors. And I can tell the builders right now, they are going to find ledge. Every Practically every house on the street has ledge as part of their foundation. It's just uh, that's why there's such big water problems, too, is because the neighborhood has ledge. But I just don't understand. You've had the meeting tonight. Every single person that has contributed anything has given a negative feedback to this large construction. And I know that, that houses are being built bigger and bigger these days, but this is kind of ridiculous. I mean, it could be bigger without being that big. Mm. It, it's, it's just inconsiderate to the neighbors that live here and to anyone um, in the surrounding houses. And so, you know, I'm old and I'm crotchety, but I'm also a long time neighbor. And I just don't want to see my neighborhood go to heck. Reject. So I really think you should just plain reject this proposal. Let them come up with something that's a little more in line with what the neighborhood is. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Mr. Chair, can I just address that real quickly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. I, I just want to say again, um, to Eric's point, You're not on mute. Uh, we we um our intent was um to build by zoning laws um and not to ask for a variance um also to note about the size um we did do uh you know public record study of other homes in the area um and just to give you just a few homes that would meet you know close to what we're uh looking for for a gross uh, living area um, 181 Foster is 2,840 square feet. 185 Foster, uh, Foster is 2,425 square feet. 183 for Forest is 2,478 square feet. Um, so if we're talking about th scaling it down three, 400 square feet, um, you know, that's, again, that wasn't our intention to push it 400 square feet and to get you know, the opinion of every neighbor that this is such a mega development. Um, but again, uh, I completely understand everyone's concerns. 
Thank you. <sighs> okay. Um, added on to the list again. Uh, is Johnson, uh, Johnson Tangelo. Yes, John. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond to the size of the houses in the neighborhood. Um, the houses mentioned by their square footage are all on far larger lots. The, um, mm. My lot is 185 Forest Street at 24. Or 23, 2400 square feet is on a lot of 0.4 acres, whereas the lot size of 189 is only where is it? 0 0.23. 0 0.23. My, my lot is twice the size, and I have 900 square feet or, or 600 square feet less. So the proposal is outsized. Even uh, 181. Mm -hmm. Uh, forestry Jessica's house is almost as large, but the property card seems to show her lot as being 0.2 acres, but her lot is about the same size as mine, almost the same size. Um, just, it's obvious to see that. And so all of the large houses listed are on larger lots. This is too small and too narrow of a lot to build a house that's nearly 3,000 square feet. And I get that people want to buy big houses. You know, everyone wants to buy the mega mansion and that it's just not the space to put a mega mansion. If this were a flat lot that were, that had more, maybe 45 uh, feet of frontage rather than 30, then you could probably fit a bigger house on it, but it is a small lot that's just very long and narrow. And unfortunately, when they, when they built, when they, when they um, surveyed the lot, when they, when they drew the lines to the lot a hundred years ago or whenever they did it, that, that's how they made it. And that's something that's just set in stone. You can't change that. And unfortunately it's not, you know, it doesn't work with the modern uh, wants and needs of, of people, but it can't be changed. You know, I, I, that's that's all my comment. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Colorus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think I gave you my address before. If you needed that for the record, is two one two Forest Street. Um, this might have been addressed earlier, and I didn't see this in the um, in the proposal. But I just was curious, given the the housing shortage in the area. Um, if you're going to build something with that amount of square footage, was there any consideration to a more affordable housing for multifamily homes as opposed to a, a single home on that huge plot? Um, so it's a single family district. So um, the zoning bylaw restricts you to a single family house or a single family house with an accessory dwelling unit. Those would be the only two housing options. Gotcha. Thank you. And I can tell you, we did look at both of those and a two family, just a straight two family or um, kind of the 20, you know, using the same area. But like you said, this was the zoning compliant option that we, we, we arrived at because we wanted to comply with all of the zoning requirements. Um, Ms. Grill? Yes. Yeah, so um, to address, I, the, the, the monstrosity that people have talked about on the other side of Layla is actually a two family house. So mm -hmm. I'm really confused about the zoning laws. And we, we do know that there were things that were not legal and there was a <clears throat> 10 year building ban due to pulling down a historic house. Um, but that is a two family house. So I am a little confused about that. I That's why want, I asked that same question. Thanks for raising that. Yeah. So I do want, I'm, my battery's about to die, but I do want to um, add on to what John um, was saying so my house not only I'm at 181 so I'm set uh, John and I are both set off the street we are the larger houses in the neighborhood um, I'm not sure why Foster Street is considered um, a comparable plan because it's not in this direct neighborhood it's you know not 
it's not this neighborhood. Um, and um, my house actually has a has an entire other, it's a buildable lot size, but it's not buildable due to no road frontage. So I actually have two lots that are up there. Um, so those are the two points I wanted to make. So our houses do not detract from the feel of the neighborhood. We are the outliers. We almost didn't build an addition on because we were afraid that we would outprice the, the neighborhood. Um, but because of the way that our property is set, it doesn't impact anyone else. And we do have a, a very large lot. It's almost a third of an acre when you add the extra the um, extra property on that we all own that's just land. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see one new name on the list. Um, we have a we have a lot of people sort of just sort of tagging on, tagging on, tagging on. If there are people who who definitely want to address the board, please make sure you raise your hand um, so that we we have a sense as to uh, who is looking to address the board. Um, next would be uh, Mr. Tomlinson. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. My name is Mark Tomlinson. I'm at 192 Forest Street, and I, I just wanted to point out that if we step back from this meeting, if we think about everything that was said uh, this evening, there, there's a lot we don't know, and there's a lot that I think we have to look more closely. And the com the the lot comparison that was just made feels very disingenuous to me, and a lot of the concerns over trees the slope, the shelf, are legitimate concerns that we don't have any strong data on. What we're hearing is a lot of, I think it's this, if I remember correctly, it's this, I don't have that paperwork with me right now. Um, at the very least, we need time to look at this more closely. Although I am against this change and, and I would recommend that you, uh, that you simply disallow it. But at the very least, we need much more time to look at this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that and seeing no further hands raised, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public comment period for tonight. Um, I'd really like to thank everyone for um, all their comments um, and all their different, uh, the different points they've raised. You've certainly given us a lot to, excuse me, a lot to consider, a lot to think about. Um, so returning back to the board, so what we have before us um, is an application. It's a filed, excuse me, as a large addition, which is, you know, anything that is at least 750 square feet outside the footprint of the existing building. And um, under the zoning bylaw, there are specific criteria that the board needs to consider because it is a large addition. Um, but in addition to that, um, as we've noted, there's a question as to whether um, this also needs what would uh, under 813, which is a, what's referred to this uh, section six determination as to whether um, there's an intensification of an existing nonconformity that would be happening as well that would require um, a different evaluation. And as we said, sort of at the start, there's some questions about what the actual usable open space is today and what it will be afterwards. Um, and I think certainly based on that and other concerns, um, I think there are, there are several items that the board would um, would want to see before it makes a final decision on this application. Um, and so I would ask the board if they could um, to put forward what, what pieces of information they think that we need to clarify and that we need a uh, much better definition on um, sort of going forward. The ones that I had sort of noted um, as we were going along, there was definitely some questions about where the existing trees are on site. And if those could be added to um, to the site plan so we can understand better uh, where the trees are in relation to what is being proposed. Um, and um, there's also the a question was raised about uh, shadow studies, which are, are something the board doesn't ask for very often, but I do think in this situation, um, 
it would be very informative as to uh, what the what the shadow what the shadows are today and what they're anticipated to be um, going forward. So I think that that is information that the board would like to be able to review as a part of its consideration. Um, are there other things that the board would like to see um, as a part of, um, would like to see from the applicant before they consider this application? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I, I would like to see drawings that show the uh, proposed building in relationship to the uh, abutting uh, houses, abutting structures, really. Um, we've, we have the uh, pictures that were provided by Mr. Aranau earlier, which, which I thought were very helpful. Um, but if we're going to evaluate sort of what we think the implications are, are in putting this particular structure in this particular space, which already has buildings around it, uh, it's important to see it in relationship in a plot plan, really in relationship to uh, those other those other buildings. So I'd like to have something to have a broader a broader look so that we could evaluate those relationships. I guess the other thing is that that and this sort of is part of the usual open space, but it would be valuable, I think, to have some sense of the contours so that we could evaluate the slopes. Thank you. Um, I would also just add on the floor plans, if it could be more clear as to what's existing and what's proposed. Sure. Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Riccadelli, just, just to add one more item. I, I don't think it's um, really a new drawing, but uh, you know, we, there was a discussion about um, the permeability of um, the the new surfaces um, on the lot, the driveway, the the walk. Uh, so, if that could be noted on on the plans, I think it would be helpful for us um, just evaluating it. Okay. So, what surfaces are permeable? What surfaces are impermeable? Yes, that's right. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Um, so the public comment period is closed. Um, is Mr. there- Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont? Yeah, I just wanted to add on, uh, Mr. Hanlon had directed our attention to the section on large additions. So it was a bit different than just a straight special permit consideration. And I would like the applicant to also take special note of the fact that at the end of that section, which is referred to in the memo from uh, planning department in 5.4.2 B6, it says that at the end in making its determination, the board of appeals shall consider among other relevant facts, the proposed alteration or additions dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures. And so I think that that's a very important uh, point for us not to lose sight of, as has actually been articulated by many speakers tonight. But if the scale, the massing and all of this, even though the comment was made by one of the applicant speakers saying that it is zoning compliant, uh, that may be true in some general sense, but it is also true that we have to satisfy this particular uh, requirement as well of that section that I've just noted. Mm -hmm. So I would ask the applicant to consider that. Cool. And I think it would also be helpful um, if the applicant could, I don't know, you know what your plans are in terms of you know, when in the process you would be doing a, any kind of subsurface evaluations, but if there's any way to give us a better sense as to what the the impact will be um, regarding a ledge on the site, um, that's something that the board has requested on on prior applications, especially in a situation like this where 
there are houses that are, you know, less than 15 feet away that are attached to the same piece of rock. Um, that if it's really important that we understand what the you know, what the possible implications would be if there is the the need or the intent to do any kind of, of chipping or um, on the site. Mr. Mr. Hanlon? Um, I just wanted to underscore something that, that we all sort of know, but we don't usually have occasion to say. Um, but in both in general and special permits and here, the board has to actually find that the alteration is in harmony with the other structures and uses in the neighborhood. Um, and this puts us in a situation where, where we need to be re we we need to be able to make that finding, and there's this question of burden to proof here. If if at the end of all of this we still can't make that finding, not because we can make it a contrary finding, but because we just we just don't have the uh, the ability to make a positive finding, then we will have to say we will have to deny. Um, so the applicant has to decide what the applicant wants to do and how far they need to go to persuade us and so forth. Um, but if after all of that, there's a really substantial uncertainty that remains on an important point, um, then we have to we have to give that the effect that the statute requires us to do. Um, so I just sort of encourage them. It, it's 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 really it's been a frustrating hearing in a way because a lot of issues come up and a lot of times the the question is well someday someday that will be taken care of and in the normal course mostly that is taken care of we're just operating in a in a system that has a lot of other gateways in it the, the town engineer is taking a look at this the tree warden is taking a look at this and so on and yet we know that things don't always come out the way they're supposed to even though the laws have it all set up so it's a great system and we have to play our role in it and our role at this point is to be able to make the finding the statute requires us to make. And uncertainty is not the friend of the plaintiff's case, of the applicant's case. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Is there anything further from the board at this time? Seeing none. Um, So based on, based on the, the testimony tonight and the discussion among the board, um, the board would highly recommend that we um, continue this evening um, to a future date to give the applicant some time to put together some, um, some additional information and to, um, to consider the, the testimonies received and, and some of the comments, particularly about the, uh, the adjacencies to neighboring houses um, and the, the, the density of the neighborhood and to uh, consider that in their plans and then come back to the board um, with you know, with revisions if you think that's appropriate or, or with the same application with more uh, with more information for the board. Um, that would all be very helpful. Um, so would the would the applicant be willing to entertain a continuance? Yeah, yes. Um, so let's see, just pulling up the calendar. Um, so I think the 28th of February is the next date. Do we have, uh, Mr. Vellarelli, do we have any anything scheduled for the 28th at this stage? Oh, we do not, Mr. Chairman. Do we have anything scheduled for February? Uh, excuse me, let me go back on that. So we did have something scheduled for the 14th. So it's not a favorable favorable day. So I think we're gonna push that to the 28th. Okay. So we do have one other minor residential case scheduled for the 28th. Okay. So I think we would be seeking to continue um, this hearing until Tuesday, February 28th. At seven thirty. Um, does that date work for you, gentlemen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then, 
with that, um, may I have a motion to continue? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that this matter be continued until a date certain, date certain of February 28th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So vote of the board to continue. Uh, Mr. Roger DuPont? Aye. Uh, Patrick Hanlon? Aye. Uh, Venkat Holly. Thank you. You still with us? Uh, ben, ben Riccardelli? Aye. There he is. Thank it. Aye. Aye. There we go. Um, Elaine Hoffman? Aye. Thank you. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 189 Forest Street until Tuesday, February 28th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Uh, thank you all very much. Thanks to the applicant for the for all their information. Thank you very much to the public for all your, your interest and your input this evening. It's very helpful to the board. Thank you all. Thank you, Chair. Uh, with that, the board will go back to the administrative items on the agenda. Um, so I want to see, ah, Mr. Fleming is here, good. Um, so I had asked, so Mr. Fleming had asked if he could uh, address the board to get some input um, on an article he's proposing for town meeting. Um, and I also want to just quickly take the opportunity to go through some of the zoning articles that the ARB is considering. Um, they had their meeting last night um, to decide which articles to put forward and I was unable to attend, so I'm not entirely sure what they're doing. Um, but most of the things that the ARB was considering relate almost exclusively to the industrial and business districts, which pretty much fall outside our purview. Um, they were looking at one that would, uh, looking at the different kind of open spaces as they relate to the business districts, um, one looking at addressing, uh, changing the rear yard, the required rear yard setbacks. Uh, there's one looking at changing the step back requirements, which is where the buildings after a certain height have to step in. So they're looking to possibly address, change that. Uh, we have what's referred to as a reduced height buffer area between business and residential. That's very hard to understand. So they're looking to clarify that. Um, they're looking to change corner lot requirements in business districts so that maybe the side street doesn't have to be treated as the exact same way as the front street. Um, they're looking at looking at height minimums in the business districts, uh, looking at a larger program is an Arlington Heights business district, which would be sort of a larger overlay district, um, stretching basically from where Forest Street meets Mass Ave um, all the way to Lexington. Um, they're looking at some of the uses that are available for in the industrial district, uh, solar in the industrial districts and uh, ARB's jurisdiction over properties in the industrial district. So those are the things that specifically the ARB is looking at. None of those really impact us, but what Mr. Fleming has um, would directly uh, affect us and our work. So uh, James, if you're able to unmute yourself, um, just a quick introduction to the board and tell us what you're considering. Sure. Um, I don't suppose you have the, you got the memo that I had sent over, did you? Um, I, I didn't I, see it in the materials. If, if not, that's okay. Oh, I thought I had. Oh, okay. Let me let me find it. Apologize for that. That's okay. Um, either that, or we can give you control if you want to bring it up yourself. Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> it might be more expedient, though. It might be. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Fleming is good to go if he chooses to do that. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Valerelli. Sure. Um, so let me quickly grab it and I'll give you an introduction. Um, so I should first, James Fleming, 58 Oxford Street. So um, this, the article in short, the purpose of it is would be to remove the usable open space requirement for one and two families, um, just and it's entirely just completely gone. Let me find the proposal. Oh, 
Okay, I have it up. Okay, are you able to see it? Yep. Perfect. Um, so the base of the background is that every resident, every property with, with a residential component has to have open space that's usable, which is a 25 by 25 square that is less than eight foot, eight, eight less than eight percent in grade. Oh, we heard about it a lot tonight. Um, and it's set as a percentage of the size of the building. Um, so what I would like to do is make it so that it doesn't apply. And the goal that I have in mind is that the person who, the stated purpose of the usable open space is for the enjoyment of the residents who live on the property. But if someone has made a decision to encroach upon it or reduce it and possibly become non-conforming, they've already made a conscious decision that the living space that they would gain is more valuable than the open space they would lose. Um, what the in thinking about this, there are also a bunch of other requirements on the property that limit um, what you can do with it that I think to some degree make the usable open space requirement redundant. So one is lot coverage requirements. So if you already have a large percentage of your lot covered, you can't just expand into your usable open space willy nilly because you have this other restriction on you. And then of course you have the rear setbacks, you have the rear and front setbacks, side yard setbacks, things like that. And to some extent, this really only this change would really only apply to R2 uses and older non-conforming single family uses. And the reason is that the front yard setback for single families has been 25 feet for, I think, since the 50s. It's a very long time. And so if those those front yards are de facto usable open space and this almost by definition can't apply to them. So what this is really targeted at is sort of the older housing stock that was built before we had that setback or built before we even had, in many cases, zoning at all. Um, elimination sounds kind of scary. Um, one thing I was able to find is that Medford, and I'll go down here, Medford has a very similar definition of usable open space, um, which is based on a percentage of gross floor area, although theirs is defined as a little like ever so slightly differently. Um, theirs also doesn't apply to detached single and two family dwellings. So it appears as if we, would, it, we wouldn't be without precedent in doing something like this. Um, and in thinking about other ways we might change it, no matter how I touched it, we would run into some other kind of problem. Um, these are some slides I showed to the ARB about um, changes you may have. So one of the problems is that if you add building space, you need more yard. But if you can't get more yard, then there's a chance you could become non-conforming by doing so. Right now, this is if maybe we get rid of that requirement, for example, and say it's based on the lot area, some fixed value. The problem is that the top row here is a existing house that can currently add a 10 by 15 addition on their back, and they would still be in compliance with the usable open space. So for example, this house has um, a, what is it? This house is, is fully conforming for something like R2, and their um, usable open space is 103% of gross floor area. They can add this addition right now, and that cuts their usable open space in half, but they're still well over the 30% threshold that they would, that are they're required to have. Now let's say we take that and make it based on the lot area. This house is still conforming as is 30% of the lot area, but now they could no longer add this addition because this usable open space would be 15% of the lot area. So in, in this, admittedly, this is a contrived example to show the point, but there are tens of thousands of lots in Arlington. I, I really don't want to be the one taking the risk that I cause someone to lose an ability to make an addition that they currently would have. One other thing you could do is you could, sorry, go back here. You, we could maybe change the percentage, but we still don't get out of the situation where there is no guarantee of not creating a problem for somebody somewhere. Um, unless you reduce this percentage to a very small number, at which point it is very close to just getting rid of it in its entirety. The <laughs> other way, Oh, sorry. Yes, please go ahead. No, I think that was a cough. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the other way is um, that I've considered modifying as well, you have these 25 foot minimum dimensions. And so, well, maybe you could just shrink that. Um, this is a example of a non-conforming use where you are, um, in this case, if you're at 22% of your lot area is usable um, or is a non-usable open space. Um, so you, you have none, um, which you can go up as is without a problem. Um, so in this case, we add a 50% addition on a two-story building. Their gross fill areas are, as a percentage of usable open space goes down, but they don't have any to begin with. If we shrink that dimension, all of a sudden it becomes usable open space. So if they become conforming, and then they they would lose the ability to add this dormer because now they would be going from 33% of gross floor area, which is now a usable open space dimension because it's 20 feet. If they tried to add that dormer, now they would exceed um, the or they not not exceed. They would go below the 30% threshold. So in this case, we'd be going down from 33% to 26% by adding the dormer. I'll pause. Does this make sense? It makes sense in my head. I just want to make sure it makes sense to you. Well, it, it was interesting because the you know you had come to us because the ARB wanted to get the sort of the benefit of our experience. So, you know, usable open space is something that comes up routinely in houses in East Arlington that are looking to do attic uh, buildouts, and the situation with almost all of them is not that they're they don't have enough usable open space. It's just that they have none whatsoever. Um, and you know, looking at this look at this example, it's it's an interesting question. Like, you know, if we were to do something that would all of a sudden make people compliant with usable open space, now there's a you know there's a whole level of additions that we are now disallowing if we do that. Um, exactly. But part of in my my mind is just, I'm, I've been go, trying to go back and think like how many cases have we had where somebody actually had usable open space and this this really made it that you know trying to come trying to conform with these open space requirements was difficult and I honestly can think of like one or two in all the time I've been on the board um and in most cases, the use of the, the lack of usable open space is not that there's too little or that they have some and we're they now we're going to cross the threshold. It's that they just have they just don't have any period. And so we are relying on other means of reducing the, you know, of, of constraining the, the size of the house on the land. And as you you know correctly pointed out, we already have several other methods of doing that. We have uh, yard setbacks, um, which if they're compliant with the yard setback, then that's gonna constrain it. If they're non-conforming, then you know they need to make their case before the zoning board that that they need to that they should be allowed to make it further non-conforming. Um, same with lot coverage. Um, I've never seen us get into trouble with the landscaped area, but that's only 15% and anything counts. So that I don't see us ever getting to that point either. Um, so, a, so a lot of the so a lot of these cases are interesting, but I'm almost you know I I think to your initial point of you know do we just say we don't you know is it worthwhile to just get rid of usable open space for single and two family housing because it really doesn't do anything or do we say well let's leave it in because it doesn't do anything it's an Quirk. It's a, you know, as you know, it's sort of it's a quirk from the past, and it doesn't really impact a lot of what we do. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, uh, the uh, the situation where it doesn't really impact things uh, is really essentially when you're putting a dormer in, but you're leaving the but you're not making another addition so that you're still within the, the footprint that you started with. If in addition to the dormer, there's some other addition that changes the footprint, then usable open space uh, potentially bites. At, at that point, we have to make a, a, 
a determination that it isn't worse than the existing nonconformity. I think ordinarily we do that, but from the point of view of somebody who wants to do something with his house, you've gone from being able to do something as a matter of right, or effectively as a matter of right, um, and having to go through our process, which causes uh, both cost and delay. So it, it does seem to me that 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 while only some of our cases actually involve that, not the not by any means the majority, actually a fairly small minority. In those cases, this is a potential problem and, and there's uncertainty as to what we'll do. This this board has taken a certain view to it, but you know, in five or ten years we've got different people with different attitudes. They it 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 may not be entirely the same as as what we're doing here. What troubles me about usable open space is all of the dimensional requirements that are are put in, um, and which are the things that make it something other than just open space. And maybe if you sort of said, okay, well, a usable open space doesn't include the driveway, you could that would make some sense. Although I must say that when I walk down my street and see people playing near their houses, they're most often on the driveway shooting baskets and, rather than in the in the yard doing picnics um, or washing their laundry. Uh, but you know, when, when you look at the statute and if you take the reason for the usable open space requirement at face value, if we assume that what we say the purpose is, uh, is is what the purpose really is, and that this isn't just sort of a gentleman's way of putting an additional control on building size. It's supposed to be the part of the lot that's designed and developed for outdoor use by the occupants of the lot for recreation, including swimming pools and tennis courts or similar facilities, or for garden or household service activities like clothes drying um, and or gardening and that sort of thing. Um, and all of those are things that are relevant for the, are essentially protecting the owner of the property. We have other rules that are designed to protect people who are adjacent to the property or people in the neighborhood. But usable open space it has the peculiar definition that it has because it's focused on protecting the person who owns the property. And yet, most often, this is when it becomes relevant at all, it becomes relevant because the person who owns the property really wants to do something else. They want to, that they may want to use their their yard in a way that's inconsistent with the usable open space requirements and, and so on. Um, and it makes me sort of wonder whether whether the kind of work that this concept is doing um, is something that is worth putting still another restriction on, or whether if we really are interested primarily in protecting the interests of the neighborhood and the butters, we why aren't the other why aren't the other things that we we have including landscape open space um sufficient sufficient to do that um and and at that point we don't need to be paternalistic about it and we can let people use their houses the way uh the way that makes most the most sense to them rather than having uh, something the town has figured out that they really want people uh, people to have. This isn't like a hidden defect or anything that you need disclosure on. Everybody can see what kind of space they have and decide whether that's attractive, uh, attractive to them. Uh, I know that when we moved here a few years ago and we live in a duplex with what most people would say is a fairly limited amount of open space, my wife almost refused to buy it because there was much too much. At our age, we didn't want to take care of a yard and so the less yard we had, the better. That, that isn't the attitude we had when we had young children, but you know, people are different and that's make way against having this concept. In any event, I don't think that, it's, that it would make, that it would be a difficult, if we didn't have this to work with, I don't think it would complicate our lives particularly. In other words, it's, it's not one of those things that, that we need this in order to make the regime that we enforce work. It, if if anything, it, it tends to count in the other the other way. Thanks, Matt.
the other members think? Uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Ms. Hoffman. Um, I, I, I find myself a little puzzled by, by the whole topic. It's, I, on the one hand, especially following the hearing we just had, because I agree with what everyone has said that the usable open space, the, the way it's defined is so restrictive. Um, and as Mr. Hanlon was just saying, it, it's specific to, um, you know, the needs of the occupant as opposed to the neighbors. But I will say that, you know, in some cases, it seems like the, the setbacks aren't always sufficient from the view of the neighbors necessarily in, in it, it seems like sometimes adjacent property owners are concerned about the size of the additions beyond just the setbacks. And in some rare cases, potentially usable open space um, could be an important factor there. And it seemed like it would have been even potentially in tonight's hearing, if not for the slope. Um, and I don't know, I don't know if that's a valuable point even to be dwelling on, but um, it does seem like it's capturing something that that's maybe a little bit elusive to capture. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I'm curious if anyone else kind of can pick up what I'm getting at here. Like everyone was very concerned about the drainage impacts, the sunlight impacts, and there's not actually a single factor um, that we can rely on um, to sort of guarantee that those will um, function appropriately for adjacent sites. Does that make sense? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I think, I mean, I, from James's point of view, this isn't necessarily the best night to have brought this before us. But when I think of the other hearing, it's a really good example of, of how this all works. The, the thing that primarily protects, protects the butters, the butters is the provision on large additions. And we'll go through all of the right considerations as we, as we examine that in light of whatever the applicant uh, provides to us. And that is specifically designed to deal with the situation where you meet the setbacks and nevertheless, for some reason, it's not enough. Um, and and so we have that, that does that. Um, now, many of the other things with the sun and that sort of thing are either not affected by usable open space, or if they are, it's more or less arbitrary. In other words, the usable open space as a concept isn't designed to get at those things. Now, it does mean that we have to exercise our judgment in light of the material of whatever is there, but you know, I'd rather sort of exercise my judgment the way the, the statute says that we should do than use a concept uh, that, than to use a concept that isn't really designed for this, but that may under certain circumstances fit into the overall feel of the case. And I'll say that I was had a great deal of concern in the other case about whether or not they met the usable open space requirement and whether, whether, but that was a sort of a rule of law sort of thing. If, if as long as we have it, it's our job to enforce it. Uh, and if the tabulations aren't right, and if, 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 if we're not following the right procedure because we need to make a section six finding or whatever, then we need to make sure that we do that in the right way. But that doesn't go to ultimately to whether or not we actually need it. And at least in the way I look at the other case, I look primarily at the large addition provision and get from that the criteria that I think that we need in order to deal with that kind of situation. And I think that comes up generally. The zoning, this, this zoning bylaw, you know, covers over every possibility and so thickly that loopholes have a hard time developing. And 
there's always some other some other thing uh, uh, to use. Um, but in any event, in that particular case, I was impressed as I was going through that while I cared about usable open space, when I got to what the neighbors were really caring about, they weren't caring about usable open space at all. They were caring about how close it was, to, how big the house was, and how close it was to the to the side and the and 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 all of that. And that's what we would normally have in that kind of a case, in a large addition case. That's what the statute asked them to be talking about, and that's what they were talking about and what we will consider. Rick, what is what is your sense on on this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, my opinion is it's a safeguard. Um, in rare instances, it will make an impact. Uh, in a lot of instances, it won't. It's just a safeguard uh, going forward in the future where everybody, everybody's concerned about the size of houses, uh, so on and so forth. And it's not getting any slower out there. So um, I think you guys are correct in your assumption that generally it doesn't matter. But uh, sometimes it does, and that that one time um, may make a difference. Uh, just the opinion of uh, ISD. Well, you have a lot more experience in this than we do, so very very appreciated, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, just to yeah, <clears throat> maybe build on um, what Elaine uh, was mentioning. Um, one thing that I've noticed, and I've been on the board um, less time than many of you, uh, so maybe you guys have different examples or experience, but um, it's just so rare um, that we have a property that has a rectangular lot uh, where it's easily applied that there's, you know, uh, a clear defined backyard and side yards and front yard. Uh, quite often, they're really unique shaped lots uh, like the one we saw today was uh, about the strangest lot I've seen uh, um, and so um, what I've noticed that the usable open space does is um, if we were to if if a developer for instance were to design a building to the zoning envelope i.e just taking every offset backyard rear yard side yard and just extruding the building straight up um, this pushes that uh, with these unique shaped lots to actually define a more open area somewhere. And I know it's just five feet, but 20 feet um, when there's a house right on the lot line feels pretty close. Uh, so, I, you know, maybe as Rick said, it, it feels like even though it's, it's redundant and it may not make a difference many of the times, uh, in the times where we have evaluated this, it's been because someone's building as big as they can without much guardrails. And this is the thing that we've been using to sort of push, push back on those proposals mm -hmm. and make sure that, um, as Mr. Hanlon said, uh, we're enforcing this piece of uh, the zoning bylaw as well. Roger, any thoughts? I I swore I wasn't going to say anything, uh, <laughs> but uh, because I think Miss Hoffman asked the question, I I was sort of keeping up with her. I thought that what she had to say about, you know, it was sort of like an intangible aesthetic argument that I thought that she was making, and I think everybody's right. I mean, we don't probably employ this analysis all that much, and it probably doesn't affect all that much. But when I've ever read the whole open space, landscaped open space, usable open space, I've always thought that it was there really for some sort of sense of aesthetics. And maybe that's not our job, but that's the way I've always felt about it. And so I don't think it's a bad thing to have it. And, um, you know, and I don't think it would be catastrophic not to have it, but 
I don't know. I may be just set in my ways. <laughs> so that's how it seems to me. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I, I just wonder, and I'm, I'm guessing we don't get the answer to that tonight, but I am impressed by the fact that Medford, that follows more or less us in our definition of usable open space, um, doesn't apply it to one and two family uses. And I just wonder how satisfied they are with that. Do, do they is, it, do, is there any feeling on their side that they really ought to be more like Arlington still because they uh, because this doesn't doesn't quite do it for them. I have mean, this feeling that there's a there's a certain stickiness that's here is that whatever you have you would just assume have rather than change. And I guess they're probably my guess is they're not probably any more eager to imitate them than we are eager to Im imitate them. But but still, you know, there is a laboratory experiment. There is a neighboring jurisdiction, which in some ways is similar, that doesn't have this, uh, even though they accept the general concept. And it would be useful, I think, for the ARV to have a better understanding of what, our, what Medford thinks of its own rules. James, you didn't happen to talk to anyone in Medford about this, did you? No, I didn't. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Moore. Are you going to take public comment on this? Um, could. <laughs> you know, whatever we're doing has no, you know, we're just providing information to, to Mr. Fleming as he makes his decision. But um, if you would like to, if you have a comment, sure, we'll take that. Okay, well, well, thank you. I appreciate the, appreciate the time. I, I do have a comment. Um, I I think I, I think I see the usable open space rule uh, as a tool, um, much like much like the way a screwdriver can, is designed to screw in screws. But screwdrivers are used to pry open doors. They're used to drift. They're used for many other purposes that aren't screwing in screws. And and I just I think that just as uh, um, uh, I believe it was Miss Hamilton. I had to say, I think uh, she was the one that said it. Um, it, it. It's something which the board employs from time to time to get at something that may not be the letter of the law, the regulation is written, but rather sort of the spirit and what the spirit, what the spirit allows. I mean, the the idea that that a, pro a property owner uh, has the uh, their rights and their interests are, are paramount um, as opposed to the, the community around it. Well, that, that's true. Property rights does allow you to do what you want with your property. However, I think what, what you and the other the boards in town are trying to do is balance between the, uh, the, the property rights of individuals and the property rights or, or the rights, I guess, of a community and open space, although it's for the use of the property owner, is also ends up being for the, the visual use and the aesthetic use and the balance use of the community around that property, as was as was discussed in, in the docket tonight. Um, so again, I, I, I just I'm echoing sort of what's already been said, which is it's not something that necessarily you will, will, will rule on directly, but having it in your toolbox, having it as something that makes cases come before you for for your you know, balanced and reasoned judgment, having the cases come before you is not a bad thing. I think it allows things to get aired that should get aired, even though the point of the open space regulation directly isn't always uh, the thing at, at item. It is something that allows the discussion to get going and, and get wrapped around uh, sort of the needs of the community uh, around. So I, I think that balance that it allows you to get at with your meetings. Uh, I think it's important. So I would I would suggest that its removal by Mr. Fleming's you know, potential motion here decreases the availability of the tools and the flexibility which your group and your board currently has. Thank you for putting up with my concern. No, absolutely appreciate your perspective on that. 
because it, it is interesting because it's one of the things that we sometimes consider as the residential design guidelines and the residential design guidelines only come in if somebody has a special permit um, or a variance request and you know if we don't have that to force it then you know it, somebody doesn't need to consider the residential design guidelines at all if they can do it by right um, not that we have ever pushed very hard because of the residential design guidelines but it's certainly something that we are allowed to do um and as time is going by there's more acceptance of those guidelines and use of them i've heard more and more reference over the past two years as mm -hmm. time has gone by so i think it's a, it's a good thing yeah Mr. Chairman, i don't want to belabor this particularly but you know if the residential guidelines are good to have, then they ought to, we ought to be able to figure out a way of applying them. But the notion that they should or shouldn't apply, depending upon whether you can come up with 25, a 25 foot square patch, seems arbitrary and capricious to me. And I don't think that's a good way to organize a government. Mm -hmm. So James, have we given you any clarity whatsoever? I I was I was I, th I thought we were out of board members and then Roger spoke and then because like I I, I, couldn't, I can't see you all on one screen. <laughs> one, thing, one thing I do one thing I do want to get your um your collective take on is the, uh, the notion of the how usable open space provides a additional um what's the word an additional form of a setback from one neighbor. Um, taking this at this case as an example. Yeah. So. Um, I could build an addition over here and be in compliance. This neighbor may not be very happy about that, but I can do this by right. I could also put it over here and make this neighbor happy. And both of those cases I can do by right. So mm -hmm. in, in a case like this, to some extent, it doesn't really help you. It only helps you when you're forcing someone to go through this because they don't have enough or they would otherwise become or run into a variance. And this this addition, unless it's uh, what is it, uh, fifty percent or seven, whatever it is, the, mm -hmm. the large addition provision, you'll only see that if it's seven fifty square feet or larger or fifty percent. Now, granted, this example doesn't have that, but yeah, but to some extent, you you're, the neighbors may not like it, but there won't be an avenue for them to go down it to to go and and air their grievances. Um, Unless the, your property happens to be non-conforming, right? I mean, in this case too, they could, you know, add five feet onto the back of the entire house and still be compatible, or make their addition ten by twenty and still be compatible. It does sort of enforce a little bit of extra dimension somewhere in the around the house right but you're guaranteed that one, at least one neighbor has the possibility of being upset by what you're doing you're, you're not <laughs> and, and in, in that case you're, you're you're like like i mean maybe i guess maybe that you could argue that that's something but mm -hmm. um you know which neighbor maybe it's the neighbor you like less or maybe it's the neighbor you like more yeah Yeah. Any other feedback in general? I think that's I think that's about as much as you're going to get out of us at this hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's late. Um, so, so the, the takeaways that I'm hearing are probably useful in limited situations. Um, it depends on the case uh, that you run into. Is that fair to say? I think so. I think so. And I think to, it would be interesting to know what Medford's experience is with, like, I mean, I don't even know that, like, well, you know, it's possible that they've never had it for residential, but if, it, if they made the change, I'm curious what, what they did and why they did it, but that may not be something that's easily researchable or understandable. Yeah. Okay, I can I can put in a 
Uh, hopefully they'll take a message from a random outsider. Um, yeah. So, so your recommendation would be to learn more about what Medford, if they've just kept it for the same for however many decades, or if they've made the conscious choice to make it this way. Yeah, I think it's just, it, it's curious that they, they did it that way. So I'm, you know, yeah. half of it is an academic curiosity and half of it is, you know, what it, what is the policy implication? Yeah. Okay. That's useful feedback. Anything else from anyone? All right. Thank you very much. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, and then as far as other things that may come up zoning wise, all the, you know, James's proposal is a citizen article. I have no idea what's been filed for citizens, but I think tomorrow is the application deadline. So um, we will, you know, as soon as the select board gets around to putting together their list, which will probably be in about two, three weeks, uh, we'll see what else is, what else made the cut. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, attending the ARB meeting last night, and uh, you you do need to be aware there are a couple of things they've decided not to move forward. Ah, okay. I think there were perhaps two, at least one, maybe two. So check check on that if okay if you're interested. Thank you for that. I'll I'll definitely check in with them. Um. Next on our agenda was about the hybrid meeting dry run session. So been trying to sort of coordinate a bunch of different people. It looks like Monday, February 13th at 4 p.m. to see if that works for everybody. And so it would be in the town hall annex or at home it would be a good to split us up a little bit. Um, but that would be the date and time. So Monday, February 13th at four. That, that'll work for me. Excellent. That will work for me. Great. Me as well. Wonderful. So unfortunately we have to put it on the town calendar um, because it, it is technically a, a, a meeting. So we have to put that. So Rick, if I could put that on you. Yes. <laughs> I well, can fairness, we have not but... asked Mr. Moore whether it's okay with him. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, ask Mr. Moore what? <laughs> whether, Are you available at that time as well? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've already been through the hybrid dry run with my own committee. Uh, and it went very well. As long as you have someone who knows the system, you'll have no problem. You don't need my help. Thanks. Okay. I appreciate the offer, though. <laughs> So, Elaine, you said you could make it, but probably remote? Yes, exactly. Perfect. Mr. Chairman, I was only going to add that if you need to know the system, if that's their technical expertise requirements, if you're on site in person, I'm not the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll figure it out. Know. <laughs> Again, I, I would suggest that. Uh, one person be designated as the, the technical person and other than the chair, because there is some work that has to be done that way. Yep. For committee, I mean. All right, so I will let everyone know, everyone at the town know that we're, that date works for us. We'll keep that. Um, then update on the zoning assistant position. So town meeting had voted to allow an expanded zoning assistant position. Um, and we had been looking through the fall. We had a few candidates who we interviewed uh, remotely. And then we had an in-person interview with somebody the last week of December uh, who we made an offer to. My understanding is that they have, they are in negotiations now with the town to uh, take up the position. So we will be having a new zoning assistant. I feel always really awkward talking about this with, with Rick because we're, it's sort of, we're getting Rick's replacement, but uh, not really. Rick has Rick has served us so well for so long. I hate to hate to see him go in any fashion. Now, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm indifferent about the whole thing. I'm probably the least informed about uh, 
somebody taken over my position. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't even, I haven't even met the person. I, I just requested that if this thing does go down, I need time to train them. I mean, yeah. it's not, not rocket science, but there's a lot to it as far as dates and what has to be done. And absolutely, quite, quite honestly, without the help of my wife, I couldn't even get those notices out. Um, so yeah, um, we will uh, stay posted. Perfect. I'll, I'll be here for the next few anyway. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I just wanted to point out that just 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 to say it, that the last time we actually did have a zoning assistant, Mr. Valoretti came to all our meetings anyway. So it doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> that this is like. Thanks, Mr. Hanlon. I appreciate <laughs> that. <offer. laughs> all right. And then the last piece here, just our calendar. Uh, we're. We'll be together again in two nights um, to talk about uh, the 40B uh, traffic and architectural. There was that big slew of documents that got got dropped um, last night. Uh, thanks to to Vin and Rick for getting those up on the town's web on the at least to attach to the agenda. Uh, we did have to try to reduce the size on a bunch of those files, and I think we got them all to the point where they're they're up. And I know Marissa was working on getting them up onto the town's website uh, this evening. So. Hopefully all that stuff will be up and posted. Um, I've only seen one piece of public comment um, that's come in so far uh, for the next meeting, but uh, there will probably be a couple others trickling in. Um, and I will keep moving forward. Mr. Chairman, before you break, I need to offer an apology. Uh-oh. Um, for having rudely mangled Elaine Hoffman's name, <laughs> Hamilton, briefly. And uh, I, I was curiously trying to see, find her name because I knew I was saying it wrong. So I apologize. <laughs> no problem. I appreciated that uh, people seemed to pick up what I was saying, even though I was sort of babbling. So, <laughs> no, no, it was good. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and then just on our calendar, it looks like to the after the 26th, the next is February 9, which is another Thursday night comprehensive permit hearing. We are trying to keep February 14th clear. It looks like we are safe for that now. So February 14, we will not be meeting. We'll, we'll be meeting again on the 23rd. So the next three hearings will all be for 40B. And then we're back on the 28th for regular stuff. All right. Anything else? Thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank Rick Valorelli, Vincent Lee, Kelly Linebaum, Marissa Lau for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to, to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank Second. You, Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board to adjourn. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much.